We'll get started here. Check the phone. Great. Welcome uh, and good morning on a on a gray DC morning. Um, but we're pleased to have you here. Uh, I'm Reed Kramer. I direct the asset building program here at the New America Foundation, and uh, our program focuses on policy mechanisms that promote social development and economic security, uh, especially in ways that help families save and build up their assets um, over time. Uh, we, we do know that home ownership um, has played a central role in this process, um, but we also know that it does introduce new uh, and substantial risks uh, for families um, when they're pursuing economic uh, security. Uh, and given the Great Recession and the experience of the, the economy, it, it really is important that we look critically at the home buying and the ownership process uh, to strive to learn some lessons so that we can inform and improve uh, future policy uh, efforts. So this uh, event titled uh, Mitigating uh, the Impacts of the Current Foreclosure Crisis um, is being co-sponsored by uh, La Raza. Um, and um, my, my colleagues there have, have been a really a pleasure to work with. Uh, Janice Bowdler, who directs their um, Wealth Building Policy Project, uh, has done some excellent work uh, in this uh, issue, raising, elevating the issue of, of foreclosures uh, nationwide and really promoting a, a constructive discussion about how to craft a, a, a national policy response that's capable of addressing the situation and, and doing so at, at, at scale. Um, you're going to hear from Janice uh, shortly uh, on the, uh, the first panel. But, but both of us are concerned uh, about how uh, the Great Recession and the associated job loss have impacted families, aspiring families across the country. Um, we're, we're both concerned about the disproportional impact that communities of color uh, have experienced. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that initially when the, the housing bubble burst and the stock market tumbled, uh, you know, momentarily the, the, the inequality that the country has experienced, uh, the wealth inequality, was, was, uh, was minimized uh, a bit. Uh, and certainly the Great Recession has uh, led to a lot of wealth loss in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, for those at the top, though, this was really a short-lived uh, experience because their security prices, their wealth holdings, uh, bounced back quickly. Uh, but the same can't be said for most households, where uh, home equity was the largest uh, item on the family uh, balance sheet. Uh, declining home values, uh, foreclosure pressures, these are going to depress housing prices for the foreseeable future. And I think it's going to be a, a major component that, uh, of, of, of driver of inequality for years to come, the divergence between home prices and security prices. So this is really one of the new dimensions of the inequality uh, story in America today. I think it's going to be one of the main drivers. And it's going to uh, really, uh, inequality is going to take a very different form now than it has in previous periods. Uh, when considering race, the issues are uh, even more uh, staggering. The numbers are staggering. There's a lot of data uncertainties that are out there, but uh, a recent report uh, done last year by the Center for Responsible Lending uh, estimated that uh, the wealth loss that was associated with uh, property uh, depreciation related to foreclosure in communities of color was uh, close to $400 billion uh, as of last year. So th the numbers are very uh, significant. This is a, a massive amount of wealth that's just dissipated. Uh, Four million families have already been uh, impacted. Uh, another uh, nine, eight million potentially are, are threatened by this. Uh, so it, it's a very consequential uh, situation. The foreclosure pipeline uh, is essentially full at this point. Um, and uh, it's more consequentially for families, it's very disruptive. Um, it, it's uh, people being displaced often through no fault of their own. And this means that they're forced to leave their homes they're displaced from their communities, from their social networks, uh, from their schools, their friends, their teachers. Very, very consequential stuff. So it's a very debilitating experience that I think we need to take a greater look at uh, uh, and, and see what we can do about it uh, from the federal policy um, perspective. Uh, certainly, we need to rethink what responsible home ownership looks like. We need to demand meaningful consumer protections, which we know played a part in bringing on uh, the crisis. 
And then we need to pursue some alternative strategies for uh, wealth building uh, in the future. Uh, we also need to think about how to responsibly shore up the housing market and then the finance system going forward. Uh, but today, we're really going to look at what are some of the ideas that can be get put on the table now to address the immediate pressures uh, that a lot of families are facing, uh, the threat of uh, foreclosure. So the, the goal for today's sessions are to, to talk about, uh, you know, contribute to a national conversation around uh, the foreclosure crisis and how to respond. Uh, the first session is going to talk about, focus on, you know, what's happening on the ground, what's been working, what's not been working. The second panel is going to focus on specific policy ideas that uh, have some potential to stem the tide uh, of foreclosures. And, and we'll be featuring you know, the policies that we think can make uh, uh, a large uh, difference. Uh, to help us kick off this discussion, um, we're very pleased to be joined by uh, Senator Jeff Merkley, uh, who's really taken the lead in raising this issue uh, among uh, his colleagues. Um, so, in, in introducing him, let me, let me think about how to introduce a senator. Um, you can start by thanking him for keeping the lights on this week, uh, keeping the government running. Um, but I guess that's kind of a low bar. Uh, it's kind of the, the job of our elected officials. But uh, Jeff Merkley represents the great state of Oregon. Uh, he's in his first term. He was elected in 2008. Uh, he's already, though, made his mark on a number of very consequential uh, policy debates around financial reform and health care. Uh, he's assembled an excellent staff who's uh, weighing in on this issue. Uh, Will White, who uh, you're going to hear from later, uh, played a very significant role in, in uh, running uh, uh, Portland's housing uh, department for years. Um, and um, that, that's a, a big job of, of a senator as well, and, and he's doing quite well there. Uh, but I think he's really adding a constructive voice to a number of important uh, debates, uh, a rising star in the Senate. Um, that's probably been said before about others, uh, but here's something you don't often hear. Uh, he is, I think, remarkable for his modesty and humility, the way he goes about his business. Um, we, we could back this up by showing you the car that he drove in this morning, which I think has got a few miles on it. He drove himself. Um, but I do think it's better reflected in his life's work, which uh, he's made a, a professional commitment, and he's worked in you know, long-term commitment to anti-poverty uh, work and, and affordable housing, and he's recognized that housing plays a major role in families' ability to achieve economic security and, and be able to take advantage of, of a range of opportunities. Um, previously, he led Portland's Habitat for Humanity effort and then was director of housing development for a, a pretty uh, dynamic non anti poverty uh, nonprofit uh, called Human Solutions. And there he launched Oregon's first uh, uh, individual development account program, which is a match savings program that helped families uh, save, uh, buy a home, um, put their kids through school, start a business. Uh, really innovative uh, program. Uh, he was elected to the state uh, legislature in 98, uh, quickly elevated by his peers to, s to the speaker, uh, and there he was really committed to uh, getting beyond some of the partisanship and really focusing on problem solving. And by many accounts, this, this, this worked uh, in Oregon. It was a very productive time, and I know this is an approach uh, that he wants to bring to the U.S. Senate, um, but that is a tough crowd, uh, so good luck with, uh, with those guys. Um, um, but anyway, he may, he may be modest, but he is committed to this work, and he's really been committed to getting his colleagues to recognize the foreclosure crisis and uh, the associated tragedies that really can be prevented. So he has developed uh, a multi-part plan that I think he's going to tell us about that's certainly uh, designed to help impacted families in Oregon and across the country. I know a number of these ideas are gaining traction in D.C. We're going to talk about them specifically throughout the course of the morning, uh, but they're also informing a lot of the settlement talks between the uh, state attorney generals and the, uh, the banks that are ongoing, um, which really have the potential to help remake this uh, landscape. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the New America Foundation, Senator Merkley. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Reed, and uh, thank you to the New American Foundation and to La Raza for hosting this, this gathering on this important topic of uh, asset building, wealth building, and specifically the most powerful instrument of asset building in American history, the humble home mortgage. I must say I, I really became persuaded about the power of ownership when I was at Habitat for Humanity. Habitat was in an inner city uh, community, 
that was afflicted uh, by poverty, concentration of poverty, by crime, by the crack epidemic. And as I worked with families in, in route to the possibility of home ownership and became very familiar with the community, I saw that there's a real difference between the families that had succeeded in being homeowners and those that were renting. They were each paying more or less about 500, 600 bucks a month for their housing. But that is where the similarities ended. The renting family was at the mercy of the landlord for basic upkeep, which was often subpar. Uh, the family, the renting family had to live under the rules of the landlord, which often meant you couldn't paint the house the color you wanted or plant the things in the yard that you would, would like. And they had to worry consistently about rent going up or, or being evicted. While there was a real impairment among the home ownership families, the, they had the responsibility for upkeep and they expected their children to help out, which changed the attitude in, in the, uh, the family. They were masters of their own domain in terms of uh, what they wanted their, their yard to look like or how they wanted their house to, uh, to present itself. They had their monthly rent locked in for, for 30 years and the knowledge that thereafter that they uh, would own the house uh, outright. And they were establishing wealth, both as their equity grew through their mortgage and as the value of the house uh, increased. They were also in a position where the possibility of gentrification wasn't such a threat. For the renting families, it meant that their rent would go up to the point they would have to move somewhere else and be dislodged. And for the ownership families, it meant the value of their, their house would, would increase. And that was a very different uh, situation to be in. I became involved in a, a project called Project Down Payment because since houses were relatively inexpensive and since down payments were the major obstacle, I proceeded to work with others to try to establish a, a down payment fund. The two years that it took us to assemble that fund, though, the prices in the, in the community went up substantially. And in many ways, lost, we missed the opportunity. We missed the window where families could move from renting to home ownership. Uh, and, um, and that community is now, as I speak to you 20 years later, highly gentrified. Uh, the homes that, that we were selling uh, through Habitat for $30,000, uh, some of them are worth two hundred dollars or $300,000, those families gained enormously while renting families are largely been moved out by the economic forces of, of, of higher, higher rent. There are so many externalities that, as an economist would call them, to home ownership. Uh, children of homeowners so much more likely to finish high school, more likely to go to college, much less likely to uh, be uh, on various social programs that, that have a cost to the treasury, uh, much less likely to uh, end up in, in prison. In short, the families are better off and the communities are better off and the public government is uh, better off. And given all of that, it makes sense for us to subsidize home ownership and help families start on that path. But what is enormously frustrating to me is that rather than support home ownership in a fair and even way over the last decade, instead we have had government policies that essentially turned that primary instrument of wealth development, the mortgage, into a predatory instrument of extraction from working families. And that is a mistake of enormous uh, uh, proportions, and I want to dwell on it just a, a little bit. In 2003, we had the emergence of a new subprime that used a two-year teaser rate as bait. It had a large prepayment penalty, so that was the steel trap that locked people into their mortgage. They couldn't refinance. It had uh, a system of undisclosed kickbacks uh, known as steering payments in which mortgage originators received big bonuses for steering people into subprimes even when they qualified for prime loans. You might recall that Wall Street Journal study that found that 60 percent of the families in subprime actually qualified for a prime loan. And finally uh, there was the rejection of traditional underwriting in which uh, many of the facts in the mortgage uh, report were fabricated uh, and therefore to put people into to homes that, that really were, were unaffordable. So those subprimes had all the features of a basic scam. They had a bait in the teaser rate, it had a trap in the prepayment penalty, and it had fraud. And that was allowed to go on by the Federal Reserve. It had a responsibility for regulating home mortgages. 
And indeed, I, I, uh, I've said a lot in the past about uh, how terrible it is. I was trying to think of a polite word for it. <laughs> that that failure of regulation allowed the corruption of the mortgage system. And so we, there we are with the biggest tool for wealth management being turned into uh, a, a scam or a predatory system. And now all of us, uh, and I praise the work that all of you do in this room, all of us have to try to figure out how to pick up the pieces. And certainly uh, one important thing was to end those practices that constituted that predatory system. And I'm pleased to be able to say I was able to get a ban on mortgage prepayment penalties and on steering payments and on liar loans into the Dodd-Frank legislation, partly at the committee level and partly an amendment on the floor. So hopefully, and I say hopefully because there's always uh, uh, laws can be changed and there's always regulations that can find flexibility and pathways, but hopefully we will prevent the mortgage from, from being a predatory instrument as it was over the last decade. Certainly another piece of the picture was to put the financial world back on its feet. Our government responded uh, energetically in 2008-2009 with the federal bailout and then the 2010 uh, Dodd-Frank Act to try to restructure uh, and eliminate too big to fail and a host of other, other pieces of, of that. I was involved in something called the Merkley Levin Amendment that attempted to create a modern version of a, a Glass-Steagall Act related to proprietary trading. Proprietary trading had a huge role, both in the collapse of the banking system in the Great Depression and in the 2008-2009 meltdown. But a very critical component of this is also to tend to the millions of homeowners who were wounded by the predatory system of mortgages and then by the collapse of the economy on top of that. That piece of the puzzle has, has been so deeply underattended. Uh, we haven't we haven't done well. It's as if you had a massive flood, and everyone rushed out to repair the dikes, but did nothing about the families whose homes are flooded. Last year, families across America received three million foreclosure notices. More than a million families lost their homes. We're on pace for another million to lose their homes this year. Uh, estimates that are after this year, we may see yet from this crisis another four, five, or six million families lose their homes. And the crisis has, as Reed noted, uh, disproportionately affected minority families. Seventeen percent of Latino homeowners have either lost their homes or are at imminent risk of doing so. Uh, for African American community, that's eleven percent. For non Hispanic whites, seven percent. And these disparities continue even when you adjust for levels of wealth. So we saw the U.S. government respond with great urgency and great generosity in tackling the salvation of major financial institutions, but we have seen a response both in monetary terms and kind of passion and speed uh, has been very, very slow to respond to the plight of, of homeowners. Indeed, the main program, the HAMP program that was designed, Housing Affordable Modification Program, was really um, flawed in its design, and it's been a colossal disappointment. Designed to assist three to five million families, but it's assisted perhaps around 600,000. It was authorized uh, with a vision of 50 to $75 billion being spent to assist families. Uh, we've put only about a billion dollars out the door, about a billion. Compare that to the hundreds of billions that went out to assist major financial institutions to save them. It's a voluntary program for the, the servicer, and therefore a loan gets modified only if it's in the best interest of the financial institution, not if it's in the best interest of the, of the family. And the application process has been, to not put too fine a point on it, absolute hell for homeowners. Families contact my offices in Oregon daily. I'm sure this is true across the country. I hear these stories from my colleagues all the time of families applying multiple times to their servicer. The paperwork is lost. Each person they talk to tells them a different story. They're given advice. Stop making your payments for three months. 
or make only half your payment for, for three months, or do this or do that. Oh, we're ready to go. Uh, don't worry about those foreclosure notices that you're getting. Uh, and then you get more foreclosure notices. And the combination of not having a coordinated single point of contact, a coordinated application process, a single repository for the applications, and then the dual track in which, in which the servicers pursue foreclosure at the same time that the families in middle modification is a system of complete chaos. And, and if you were trying to design a system to maximize the stress on homeowners, you couldn't think of a way to do it, it better. So many uh, uh, st uh, stories, you can pick one of the millions. Uh, uh, the Allen story is an example in Oregon. In September 2009, Allens were approved for a loan modification by one of the nation's largest banks. They had begun making their new payment under the modification when they received their first foreclosure notice. The bank assured them everything was fine, continue making their payments. But every time they called the bank to check in on the status of the modification, they received confusing and conflicting information. For over a year, the dual track continued in which they received foreclosure notices and were told everything was fine on the modification end. Then, just recently, they received notification of the bank that the checks they had been sending were only partial payments and that they were not uh, en route necessarily to a permanent modification. And so they are left still in a state of limbo, not knowing where they stand. No permanent modification, the possibility of foreclosure, and if this was just one rare story, but it is almost the norm for families that have applied for modifications. And in some cases, it almost appears that servicers have used the HAMP program as a bait. I have families in Oregon who were told they were pre-approved for modification and therefore to adjust their payments in this fashion or that fashion. And of course, how, what a terrible situation that is to have the primary program for helping families be turned into one that leads them down a, a road into deeper financial dysfunction. So we have to do all we can to change this. And many of the points that, that I'll, I'll make um, about changing it are ones that, that many of us have been making, many of you I'm sure have been making for, for a year to two years. And so it is, it is frustrating to be where we are, but we can't give up on assisting uh, families uh, who are deeply in trouble. There are, are six ideas I'm going to talk about. I've put them in, and, and Will White and my team uh, want to make sure that everybody does, you'll see them on the panel later, so I thank his help in putting together this um, proposal. It's on my website, merkley.senate.gov, and I think we have a few copies with us today, but paving the way to a healthy housing market. Now, the general premise behind this is that housing was at the heart of our recession, and until we address housing seriously and the foreclosure crisis seriously, we're going to be in this recession for a very long time. But the other premise is it's just wrong. It's just wrong to rebuild the dike and not assist the families that, that have been flooded through the, 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 the storm. So we need to, let me just start with the simple pieces that in terms of the modification program, Families need a single point of contact. Several institutions have said they're doing this. We haven't started to see that from the families that are, are calling our office for help. But I praise them if they're taking steps in that direction or they're, they're implementing that, great. But it needs to happen faster uh, and it needs to be coherent. It isn't a single point of contact if, if one officer is appointed to so many foreclosure cases that you can't ever reach that person, for example. And it's not a single point of contact if your file is traveling hither and yon and uh, documents are continuously lost out of it. Second, we need to end this dual track. If a family is in the modification process and until a final decision is reached about whether they're approved or not approved, the foreclosure process needs to be completely set aside. And by that I do not mean simply the final stage of putting a home up for auction. I'm talking about the entire set of notices. The cars arriving with notices, the person on your porch, the phone calls, the letters in the mail, it all has to be set aside until the modification process is resolved. Third is there has to be some form of third party review prior to foreclosure. One, to make sure no opportunities have been missed. Second, to make sure that no decisions have been made based on mistaken information. And third, to make sure that no laws are being broken in a rush to foreclosure. Now there's very there's many different forms of this type of third-party 
uh, intervention that have, have been uh, discussed. And it isn't that any one is the only way to go. I applaud any, any of a number of, of models. Uh, Connecticut has allowed homeowners facing foreclosure to participate in a mediation program to help them come to an agreement with lenders. And the initial statistics from that are really impressive. Of those participating in the program, 63% were able to, of the families were able to stay in their, in their homes. So then let me turn to another framework, and that is the ability to create a win-win either at the point of foreclosure or the point of bankruptcy. Banks are very reluctant to reach a deal that has anything to do with lowering uh, the value of a, of, a, of a mortgage. But at the point of foreclosure, the value of that mortgage is, is, is now dropped enormously. Or the point of bankruptcy, the value of that mortgage has dropped enormously. And so the, it changes the framework of the discussion. A servicer on behalf of a, of, a, of a bank or a trust is now looking at a situation where that $250,000 mortgage isn't going to stay worth $250,000. There's no way it's going to be on their books for that. They're going to have to sell that home. And if the fire sale price for, for homes in foreclosure is $125,000, that's, that's what they're going to get out of this. And at, at that point, there has to be a recognition that a family that couldn't pay a much higher interest, perhaps they had a 9% under a subprime loan, and is paying that on a much higher principal, perhaps 250000 that can't possibly afford those payments, could quite possibly afford a payment at 5% for, for the, uh, the price at which the bank is now going to sell the home. And let's say that's uh, $125,000 or $150,000. And so we shouldn't have a situation where that family looks by in frustration and sees that home sold at a price and mortgage that they could have afforded. And they could have stayed in that home. And they could have prevented an empty, empty house. And this is a point of win-win because if a bank is able to sell at the basic retail price rather than the, for, the uh, fire sale foreclosure price, the bank gets a little better price for, the, for that mortgage or that, that home. The second is that the, the parents certainly uh, get reestablished on a home ownership track and have the stability of a fair, fully amortizing mortgage over the next 30 years. They get those advantages that I talked about in the beginning on, on, on home ownership. The children benefit. They aren't put through the chaos of a family in, in deep stress and having to, uh, to, to find their, their feet again somewhere, uh, somewhere else. They stay in their, in their school. And so the neighborhood wins. They do not have that, that empty house. And again, I want to emphasize the bank wins. Not only do they get a better price, uh, but they also don't put out the, the money that it takes to maintain an empty home and worry about the vandalism of that home. So a national refi program that takes advantage of that situation is a significant uh, point uh, where, where we, can, we can try to make a difference in, and push forward. You do have to have a component to make this work that you have a stress test that make sure that families are benefiting who are truly financially stressed and were not engaged in a strategic default. Uh, that would be essential to the financial organization and it's a fair point. Second is we could really use a mortgage product that has been redesigned to not place so much emphasis on FICO scores but instead is a fully underwritten ability to pay mortgage but de-emphasis FICO because families that have struggled to make their mortgage are going to have set aside other bills in the process and the FICO may not be anywhere close to an accurate representation or reflection of the, the family's ability to make, to make those payments. Similarly, bankruptcy is another win-win opportunity. And current law does not allow bankruptcy judges to modify the terms of, of a mortgage. It allows them to modify the terms of your second house, your vacation house, if, if you will, or your, your yacht, or any of a host of other loans, any loan except the basic home mortgage. That is a mistake because it means that there is, is no kind of automatic mediator in the, in the process and that the possibility of a bankruptcy judge adjusting the terms brings everybody to the table and brings a, a moment of sanity and says, yes, we'll work it out because if we don't work it out today, we may not like the result tomorrow. And we know from the role of bankruptcy judges and these other loans that they rarely modify the terms, but that it serves as a, a point of leverage or encouragement for the parties to reach a decision. Well, at the time uh, that um, the, the president was uh, asking us to release the second half of TARP, just as it was elected, he made a pledge, his team made a pledge in, in writing to, to fight for this bankruptcy reform. 
They did not. They did not. They were silent. And we missed a major point to create that, that leverage. This can be still done. It, it'll probably have to have a variety of sidebars. Maybe it's done in the, the, the context of looking only backwards and not at new mortgages. Maybe it's done in the context of empowering states to make that decision. But it's worth having that debate again. But we're going to have to have presidential leadership to take on and really seize the moment in terms of assisting families in need. And finally, I'm proposing a permanent tax credit for the purchase of homes. Maybe you only authorize it for a year or two, but in my mind, it should be permanent. Now, why do I say this? It goes back to that project down payment in inner northeast Portland, where I saw that families could easily make their rent payments, could have been homeowners, but they didn't have the down payment. And in fact, they were in a neighborhood that previously had been redlined, and homeownership had been greatly damaged. And of course, that was, that was fixed. The redlining was fixed, but still the low rates of homeownership suffered from, from, from that er, those earlier actions. And so there is a conversation now about, well, we should have uh, a mortgage system in this country that really is, requires 20% down payment. Well, I've got to tell you, that would be a huge mistake. That wouldn't be fixing the mortgage problem. That would be adding to the mortgage problem. And the reason I say that is because show me a working family. Now, I live in a, a neighborhood of three-bedroom ranch homes. Uh, it's a working neighborhood. It's one I grew up in. It's one that my wife and I moved, moved back to about uh, 14 years ago. Show me a family that's buying a $200,000 house that has, can figure out how to put $40,000 aside. And I'll show you a miracle in, in, in my neighborhood. It just, it, uh, just is an unreasonably high barrier to people getting on the path of home ownership. And if home ownership is going to be reserved simply for the most successful upper middle class in America, then 20% is fine. But otherwise, we have to figure out a way to help families get over that huge hurdle of the down payment and, and closing costs. Uh, specifically, what I'm proposing is that you have a, up to a $2,500 uh, uh, credit, uh, so $5,000 uh, per family, that it requires a dollar per dollar match from the, the homeowner, and that if a family does an item, itemized deductions and exceeds the standard deduction, for every dollar you go over the, the standard deduction, you lose 25 cents off your credit. Now, why that dynamic, itemized deductions and down payment grant? It's simply this. We think about the home mortgage interest deduction as being a powerful force for home ownership. But if you really look at the details, it does not help families, working families, become homeowners. Here's the basic math. $200,000 house, 10% down, $180,000 mortgage, 5% in your first year of interest, your biggest year of interest. That's $9,000 in interest. That's less than the standard deduction. So the working family doesn't get a penny of assistance to become a homeowner in that situation. And that program, it's over a billion, $100 billion per year. That program is tremendous for folks who have already become homeowners to help establish wealth in their, in their homes. But it's nothing to help homeowners or working families become homeowners in the first place. So spending a little bit of money up front in a matching form, so there's skin in the game with the families, very much like an IDA in a well, in, in, in uh, its, its structure, is well worth the in investment. Also, at this point, such a program could help reduce the inventory of empty foreclosed homes, help families become homeowners at a point where the homes are relatively inexpensive, uh, coming at the bottom of the market, and help restore the housing market in general, and therefore have broader uh, beneficial impacts on the economy. So in conclusion, home ownership is a powerful force for wealth building, for asset building, it's for, true for families in inner Northeast Portland. It's certainly true for families across this nation. We have deeply damaged that system by allowing it to become a predatory system. We now have to pick up the pieces and restore it, not throw the baby out with the bathwater in the process. Doing so will be right for parents, right for their children, right for their communities, and right for putting the American economy back on its feet. Thank you.
why don't you have a seat there? We do, we do have a time uh, for a few questions before uh, the senator gets on his way. Um, uh, uh, very compelling uh, remarks, a lot of great ideas uh, that, as I said, we want to um, really uh, dig into a little bit later today. So we'll have a mic that goes around. Let me know if you, you have uh, a question. I'll start by asking, uh, you know, I, I did like your, your, your kind of diagnosis of some of the problems of, of HAMP uh, and also that you pointed out how much money was initially designed to be kind of put on the table for that uh, effort uh, and the limited number of resources that are going out. Uh, you know, what are the prospects of getting access to those resources and in other ways that can be uh, redesigned in a more effective uh, manner? Well, I'm, I'm very concerned that it will be difficult to gain access to those resources for other programs in part because of the structure and the limitations that were put, put on the, the resources to uh, begin with. And so, uh, uh, quite frankly, if HAMP is shut down, it, it isn't that we'll have, uh, if you will, uh, 50 billion to shift to to other programs is going to take at least as far as I'm aware it'll it would take uh, further statutory authorizations that may be very difficult to 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 come by yeah um, and uh, is there uh, um, the, the prospects you know how, how would you kind of look at your strategy for engaging with some of your other colleagues uh, going forward in the, in this in this year ahead what what are the prospects so we have engagement? to we have to pursue uh, all the various tools at our disposal. One is to encourage the attorney generals to, to push ahead. As I'm, I'm sure many of you have read, they are talking about uh, reforms for the servicers as part of the, the 50 attorney general suit. It isn't clear how quickly the suit will be settled. They're also talking about generating significant uh, resources through that settlement that could be utilized to make the program work better or to shift resources to other, other strategies. So that's, that's one point. Olympia Snow and I have, have put out a letter to regulators. We think that the regulators have power that they haven't utilized to address some of these uh, core issues regarding dual track and single point of, of contact. Uh, there's pressure that can be applied to Fannie and Freddie. The U.S. government's a major stakeholder now in those uh, companies, and those companies have been uh, uh, really uh, part of the problem in terms of, uh, of dual track and, and single, uh, single point. And then we have the possibility of, of legislation. And uh, I will be introducing some legislation within the next couple of weeks that addresses uh, several of these points. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll move the mic around, uh, and we'll start there. I thought your remarks were excellent, absolutely on point. I've worked <coughs> with a pr program called the Maryland Foreclosure Defense Project uh, for the last two and a half years. And everything you said, and I've worked with close to 200 homeowners, everything you said rang very true. My question is, looking at the uh, extraordinary consolidation within the banking industry, one thing I've seen in working with homeowners is that when loans are sold by one mortgage holder to another, um, it's not just paperwork that gets lost, it's that uh, contractual agreements uh, for loan modifications are thrown out the window, and it seems to me there ought to be some regulatory redress for that. Uh, thank you. That is, that is a great point, and we've heard many stories like that. You work with a servicer, and the loan gets sold. Suddenly, it's in the hands of a different servicer, and it's right back to, to, to square one, and that's, that's an important part of the conversation. I think it has been part of the Attorney General's conversation. Uh, I don't really have any additional details or insights on it, but your point is is absolutely well taken that uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly how we get our hands around it. Uh, you all as um, experts on the ground probably have more details, and actually I would appreciate uh, insights on, on how we might pursue that problem. All right, one more question. Actually, the staff's going to whisk him away and momentarily. So. Senator Merkley, uh, good morning. I'm Wade Henderson with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, recently, the White House announced new proposals for Fannie and Freddie that would require increased down payments uh, for mortgages going forward from this uh, controversy. Uh, some of us who've analyzed uh, those new proposals believe they will have a disproportionately negative impact on homeowners of color, African Americans and Latinos, Women, single heads of households, for example, would be adversely affected. Uh, and it looks as if uh, an over-response uh, to the problems of this subprime crisis uh, seems to have motivated the White House to begin rewriting what we think are some fundamental elements of, of the social contract. 
I'm wondering how you and other members of the Senate are looking at these proposals. What's your take on that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Wade. And, uh, uh, and I think you're re referring to the qualified residential mortgage standards of, of 20 percent down being proposed. And specifically, this is tied to a, a structure that uh, uh, started with, with a good point. That is that, that banks should retain skin in the game or originators sh who are then selling their loans into security should retain skin in the game so that they don't have an incentive, if you will, to fabricate the circumstances around the, the mortgage. They retain some, some of the risk. But then, but then you had step two, which was to say, well, if it's a really safe mortgage, we'll, we'll exempt the, the originator from that skin in the game provision. And that's the definition of a, a qualified residential mortgage that regulators are supposed to define. And then suddenly, uh, that becomes almost a standard uh, because originators don't want to retain any skin in the game, so they're going to aim at that uh, to, to reach that. It, isn't, it essentially creates two markets. You'll have your QRM market, and you'll have your non-QRM market. And uh, I, I can tell you, I just, I, uh, neither the, the, the working class community I live in now or the one I worked in with Habitat for Humanity, I just can't imagine a family that's going to have 20% uh, stashed away. And we have more and, and more of a, of, a, of a service economy where it's becoming harder and harder. Uh, to uh, establish uh, large reservoirs of, of savings um, b as those manufacturing jobs disappear in, in favor of service jobs that may be much closer to minimum wage. I mean, every dollar you save is very tough. It's why I, I loved the uh, individual development count strategy where you said we realize how hard it is to save uh, as a, uh, a, a working American. And uh, if you do the hard work of saving where, where Two years worth of work can be wiped out by a single car repair or a single visit to the doctor, but you're determined to do it. You managed to do it. We're going to, to help you and match it and, and uh, enable you to access one of the three major pathways into the middle class in America. And those, those pathways are home ownership, they are education, and they are launching a small business, or the three, three goals of the IDA. Anyway, ex extreme concern on, men, on the part of many of us about how something that started with a good idea, that is skin in the game, is evolving to what could be a tremendous uh, bifurcated market to the uh, unnecessary disadvantage of, of uh, working class families becoming homeowners or having to become homeowners at a, at a much, much higher price by being outside that QRM structure. It certainly makes sense that uh, the home buying process is extended and savings is, is elevated as a, as a more central part of that uh, in the future. Um, all right, we're going to let you go now. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you Appreciate all very it. much. Yeah. Thank you for the work. Uh, Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so uh, a quick uh, change of lineup here. So uh, bear with us as we bring up our first uh, panel. Janice will be moderating. We're going to um, keep going here. Thank you.
Good morning again. Uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Janice Bowdler. I'm the director of the Wealth Building Policy Project at the National Council of La Raza. And I just uh, want to echo Reed's comments and really thank you all for being here this morning. I hope most of you made it in uh, before the rain. Uh, but thank you for braving the weather either way. Uh, and I want to thank uh, New America Foundation for hosting us. Your, Reed, your building is fabulous. So this is a great space, and uh, we've got a full room here. So I'm excited to be a part of this. And I also want to uh, start just by thanking uh, Senator Merkley, who's left. But, uh, uh, Will, perhaps you can give him the message. Uh, not only did I think his remarks were very good, but I want to thank him in particular uh, for one part of his remarks, which was to really tell the story about what got us into this crisis in the first place. And I think it's so important when we start talking about solutions to really know how we got here and know that uh, this was not some sort of massive conspiracy on behalf of low and moderate income families to bring down uh, Wall Street and major financial institutions by uh, convincing them to put out predatory products and then taking them out in large numbers. When in fact we know that unregulated markets actually put out uh, products uh, that were uh, designed to fail, and that's exactly what happened. That led to a crack in our economy, uh, and now double-digit unemployment rates, uh, or high unemployment rates, double digits in communities of color now for several years. And so we started with a crisis really born of toxic mortgage products, and uh, now is persistent with uh, record unemployment rates. For many of those families, seeing their job search extend several months. And so as, uh, as Reed laid out, the goal of our time here today is really to, uh, to uh, put forth and elevate, put some sunlight to policy solutions that we think uh, can tackle this crisis. And I think before we can do that, it's really important to understand how we got here if we're going to design the appropriate solutions uh, to respond. So I thought Senator Merkley did a great job of that, and I really want to thank him uh, for doing that. Uh, he also, you know, threw out uh, numbers, as did Reed. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any question uh, that, that the foreclosure crisis is, in fact, a crisis. But I say that knowing that in this town and at this time, that word crisis is being tossed <laughs> around quite a bit, uh, both in our domestic space as well as our international space. Uh, and we're facing quite a bit of uh, political burnout inside the Beltway, uh, burnout amongst affected families who are unable to get solutions, uh, burnout amongst voters uh, who are reluctant to see uh, yet another program go out the door that can't actually resolve the everyday problems that they're facing. And so the challenge that I think is uh, before us uh, to a certain extent as a panel, but us as a community, is how do we uh, how do we get over the fact that we're facing this burnout, and yet we do still have several years of record foreclosure rates ahead of us? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as if this, uh, this situation is winding down, as, as you heard uh, uh, Reed and Senator Merkley state. We're looking at a million families a year for several more years, and that does not include uh, distress sales, uh, the loss of uh, home equity, and the ripple effects that that's going to have. In fact, I think it's important to note that right now we're just trying to figure out how to stop the bleeding, but in fact, we're going to see the impact of the loss of wealth and the trauma created by foreclosures uh, extend through the next generation. NCLR has uh, done some research looking at the impact on children in particular. We know that 
multiple moves, uh, moving them in between schools, the family discord created by the foreclosure has real effects on uh, their mental health, on the academic performance of children, on uh, family relationships. Uh, and that's not even getting to uh, the financial devastation. Those numbers were thrown out earlier as well. In the Latino community alone, uh, estimates of $98 billion of lost wealth. And I dare say that that number is a couple of years old and probably conservative at this point. So again, um, you know, I, since so many of those numbers were, were thrown out, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Uh, what, what I really want to shift our focus to on this panel is, is looking at what are the challenges facing us in terms of getting to the kind of uh, big-scaled uh, federal response that we need in order to really tackle this program. I mean, the numbers really are staggering, and yet we're not seeing a lot of traction inside the Beltway. Uh, I, I won't even go into HAMP. I thought Senator McLean did a very good job of, of, of really uh, talking about the flaws in that program. Uh, NCLR's uh, feelings on HAMP are, are out there. We've been uh, very public about our criticism, even supporting the termination of the program and putting those resources to higher and better use because we've, we think it's been uh, uh, so problematic. Uh, but, but they're not the only ones, right? The federal uh, government's response has been uh, underwhelming, I think it's fair to say, but so has the response from the bank industry, mm -hmm. from Wall Street, from Fannie and Freddie. Across the board, nobody escapes accountability here. We're not seeing the kind of response uh, that we need to. So, so let, me, um, let me start here. I, what I'm hoping to do is to engage my, my colleagues on the panel um, we have Wade Henderson with us from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and Will White, Policy Advisor to Senator Merkley. I really want to engage us in a conversation and see if we can start to talk about some of these, some of the barriers that are facing us and hopefully land on uh, elevating some of the, mm -hmm. uh, the solutions so that, that are out there. So let me start by asking both of you really what's at stake here? Because we're not seeing the kind of response that we want to see inside the Beltway. And yet, I think when I go out and talk to folks in the field, which uh, I do quite a bit with NCLR's affiliate base, there's a real sense of urgency in the field. And there's nobody that this crisis hasn't touched, whether we're talking about uh, the white working class, mm -hmm. uh, seniors, vets, communities of color. So from your perspective, what's really at stake in how we address the uh, foreclosure crisis? Just make sure this is on. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Good morning to everybody. Uh, Janice, that's an excellent question. And, and uh, I think what's at stake is the, uh, the ability of people who have just gotten into the middle class to remain there, as well as the opportunity for people who are working class families and individuals that are trying to enter the middle class and the, uh, the many roadblocks that are being put up uh, to, uh, to keep them from moving forward. And that's happening at a time where we're in the midst of the greatest recession we've seen in our lifetimes. Uh, and you would think at that point uh, the right response would be to say, we need to up the level of what we're doing to help families stabilize themselves, help children uh, have, a, have a more prosperous and, and more, uh, more opportunity in their future. But instead, the focus is turning to the deficit and the debt and uh, the largest cuts in government spending that we have seen uh, in a generation or two. And so we're having the resources withdrawn just as the need is the greatest in, in my adult memory. Um, so I think that's what's at stake. I think it accelerates the uh, increasing separation between those who are well off and those who are struggling in our country. There's more disparity of uh, wealth and especially of assets than, we, than we've seen in 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see that trend accelerating right now. Mm. Uh, good morning, everybody. And Janice, thanks for the question. And um, I think it's critically important. Um, I think, Will, you've helped set the stage um, for what's at stake when you've talked about entrance into the middle class um, and for many first-time homeowners. And I think that's right. Uh, but I think this is, this is really a profound time for the country. I mean, I think we are facing significant challenges 
uh, that if they are not resolved effectively will change um, our um, you know, understanding of what the social contract is, what the promise is between the American government and the people. And obviously these two wars um, are draining resources both mm -hmm. in blood and treasure, so that's a huge problem. Uh, you have the challenge of integrating a very diverse population, um, perhaps the most diverse uh, that the world has ever seen, around a, a democratic, republican form of government. That's a huge challenge. A and you have these global challenges uh, that we're facing. Obviously, you know, I don't need to tell you about the tsunami and, you know, the Libya and so forth. And we have this profound economic crisis at home. So all of that's taking place at the same time. The numbers that Janice talked about, to some degree, are a little misleading in that they don't really talk about the individual families that are at stake. I mean, you know these, these massive numbers, and you've seen the numbers, and you know what they mean. But behind those numbers, sure, guys, I'm sorry if you can't hear me. Individual stories, they're stories of people who are affected in profound ways every day, and those stories are not really part of the mix. So think about military families, for example, who own homes. The home is underwater. They can't get a short sale. They can't rent the property because they won't make enough to pay for it. The military member, husband or wife, gets reassigned. They have orders that they've got to fulfill. And they're stuck with this property that they can't get rid of. And if they go into foreclosure, they lose their security clearance. So, I mean, what's that about? You've got a huge problem with those people. And for a civil rights lawyer who, you know, has spent much of, of his life, my life, in trying to seek social change, uh, this is a profound setback. You know, America is a work in progress, guys, and, and I'm very proud to be an American, but we struggled mightily to get to where we are today. And to see this massive loss of wealth uh, being triggered uh, in the African-American communities, about 12% of the homes being lost belong to African-Americans, about 17% for Latinos. Uh, what this represents is the greatest loss of wealth documented in modern times, and it's a huge setback uh, for those communities in their effort to achieve equality uh, as we understand it today. These are structural problems that can't be ameliorated through the kind of piecemeal effort that has been undertaken. There has been no uh, effective explanation for why the subprime crisis saw a disproportionate number of African American households and Latino households affected when at least a proportion of those who were sucked into subprime loans could have gotten a paper, but for some reason did not do that. We don't understand fully why the Community Reinvestment Act has been targeted as the basis for this crisis, when in fact we know full well it had virtually nothing to do with it. So I mean, those kinds of challenges we face are significant. And I think that, just in answer to your question, uh, Janice, I think more is at stake than has been fully realized or certainly discussed. Now, last point, well, why is this happening? Because these other crises are crowding out the debate about what housing and home ownership and the foreclosure crisis means to the country. I mean, it's hard to focus on foreclosures when you see the focus having shifted at the national level to the massive debt that we're trying to resolve. And it is difficult to you know, see or, or get time for discussion when these other issues are on the table. So I think those who are activists have a responsibility to do a better job in elevating this issue in the course of the public debate. So let me pick up on this theme of, of what we've done so far. Again, you know, we, I mentioned HAMP in my opening remarks. There's uh, there are several other efforts at the federal level, uh, and yet, at least uh, from my own memory on how this was all playing out, I remember sitting across the table from an unnamed financial institution who's actually now no longer in existence, uh, who was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm urging them, what, what is your plan? How are you going to go about addressing the massive onslaught of foreclosures that are about to come your way? And they said, don't worry, we're putting out a press release <laughs> on Friday. I think you'll be very pleased. And I remember this, the press release came out and, uh, and I virtually said, said nothing. I said they were going to take a look at certain borrowers and whether or not they might qualify 
for mm -hmm. a, a reduction, temporary reduction in their interest rates. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, to me, an early sign that there really was, uh, you know, the writing was on the wall. Many of us uh, were sounding the alarm bells early. I, Wade, you stood up with uh, with my boss and uh, several others from the civil rights community in 2007 uh, uh, or eight. To the, you know, very early. It doesn't even matter at this point. Years ago, that now qualifies as several years ago, asking for a moratorium until we could put a national response in place. Mm -hmm. And what we were told, whether it was by individual financial institutions or by the federal government, is this is an isolated. Uh, uh, issue. This is an issue that's going to um, maintain in the subprime market. It's not going to spread. And so there was a, um, a real lack of political will to, um, to take on the, the sort of big picture, big scale policy responses that were actually needed to address this problem. And now we're stuck with a sort of piecemeal approach. And I'm wondering if you guys will dissect that a little bit and talk about what's out there and, and what are some of the challenges with the, with the policy tools that we currently have? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, well, I think if you, if you look at the, um, the response going back to uh, the point in time you were talking about, Janice, uh, I think with the uh, starting under the end of the Bush administration and then the very first months of the Obama administration, the, the uh, design, the goal uh, that people had was how do we respond to the subprime crisis? Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back now, it's clear that that was not a sufficiently large or mm -hmm. ambitious framework to be looking at. And that's what led to a program where, through HAMP, the goal is all about affordability. How can you get mm -hmm. someone's payments lower? And, and that might work fine if you have somebody in a uh, tricky mortgage that has a teaser rate and then it's going to jump up and if you can stop that from happening um, that would be that would be very effective but what was overlooked in that well number one the fact that we might a couple years down the road have 13 million americans without a job and millions more that are unemployed for everyone that is that has completely lost their job you have people who are either self-employed and they just don't have as many customers as they used to. I have members in my family who are uh, work in the construction industry and they might be working one or two days a week instead of five days a week and some overtime. So that, that uh, the depth and duration of the unemployment crisis was not adequately foreseen, nor was the tremendous drop in housing values that has led one quarter of all families with a mortgage to now be underwater. They owe more money than the value of their home. Now think about that. We use the term underwater, you hear it all the time. But if you own a home that's now worth $200,000 and your mortgage is a $300,000 mortgage, it's very, uh, it's very hard to have the motivation to keep scraping together the money for those payments. Um, furthermore, the response that was designed was completely voluntary so it was run through the banks and their loan servicers, and they did not, they were not required to make any loan modifications that they chose not to. If they didn't think it was going to be beneficial for their bottom line, they weren't required to. And, uh, and when you look at the various levers you have uh, to change a loan, you're starting with lowering, the, most of the modifications now start with lowering the interest rate, which is the easiest thing to do because interest rates are so low across the market. And then you go to extending the amortization period, which just means that it's going to be 10 more years before someone fully owns their home. And only then do you consider reducing the principal, even though, in, as in the example I gave, people are already, in, in most cases, deeply underwater. So that structure does not work very well. Now, I will acknowledge that some 570,000 families have gotten permanent uh, modifications, and those modifications, on average, lower their payments by about $530 a month, or 37%. For those families, that is a big benefit, but it's a very small number compared to the seven or nine million who may lose their homes over this period of time. Um, so I think we have thought too small. We've moved too slowly. If you look at how long it took to respond to the, to the major Wall Street firms and the big banks that were threatened, it took a matter of weeks 
come up with tens of billions of dollars that were put out with very little debate in Congress, very little oversight, uh, to make sure that those institutions did not go under. If we had one half of that commitment to keeping families from not going under, we would be in a much better situation today. Yeah. So that's without even going into what might happen going forward. That's kind of where I see we are now. Oh. Wade, what thoughts well, you thanks, have? Will. I, I think you're right, uh, and I, I accept a lot of what you've said as a, a good basis to begin. Look, guys, I just want to cut to the chase. Um, Money in politics distorts um, the substance of issues that we work on. I mean, that's, that's a reality of it. And um, the banks have money, and investors have money, and uh, they uh, substantially uh, invested in uh, politicians of both parties uh, to help steer the debate in ways that did not work to the advantage of those of us without that kind of political and financial clout. So um, when Janice refers to the fact that prior to the crisis getting underway, organizations like the Center for Responsible Lending, I sit on their board, they've done a terrific job, I think, in helping to educate the public about the, the substance of what was happening. They issued a clarion call long before the foreclosure crisis hit that said, look, guys, this is coming, so, so get on it. So uh, in response to that, we jumped on it politically and developed what we thought was the best and most effective response, which was to change the bankruptcy laws mm -hmm. to allow those in foreclosure to have an ability to adjust their mortgages according to their circumstance and to have bankruptcy judges use the, uh, the laws of discovery to get behind what banks were and services were saying to look at what they were actually doing. Uh, had that happened, the robo-signing crisis, which happened and came to light several years after that, would have come to light a lot sooner because those individual reviews would help to reveal what was missing. Uh, the truth is, when the Obama administration came into office, uh, we were set to have that law enacted. It had passed the House. It was the pending business in the Senate. Dick Durbin was leading the fight. We had done the vote counts. We were there. The administration responded in a conservative way. I attribute that conservative move to Larry Summers and Tim Geithner. Hey, the bottom line is they flipped it, it didn't pass, and we were left then holding the bag of not having a program that would be sufficiently helpful in responding to individual homeowners. Uh, it was in the wake of that collapse that initiatives like HAMP and other uh, sort of bank-stimulated uh, responses, which were really quite uh, inadequate to the task. And don't expect people who caused the problem to craft solutions that require structural adjustments in what they do so that they can't make the record levels of profit, which they have now since uh, made all over again. So, you know, I mean, I don't think it's, it's, it's brain surgery to suggest that the banks were not the place to look at in trying to get this effort underway. That's behind us. That's behind us. We are where we are. So let me tell you, you know, what I, I think is happening. And I think the Treasury Department under Geithner has actually been helpful in moving this forward. And I think the White House is now engaged as well uh, because I think the persistence of the crisis has been so deep and lasting. And the, the prospect for the future is so disturbing that they are willing now to take greater risks than they were uh, over the last, say, three or four years. And that's a good thing. So I think we're asking for four things, and I think they're really very simple. One, we want to extend the unemployment protection to homeowners who can't afford to pay for their mortgages, but who have real prospects of being able to survive this crisis. Right now, it's about three months. It should be extended to a year. The executive branch has the authority to do that, and we hope they will. Secondly, as Senator Merkley said, look, you've got to end this dual track process. You've got to make sure that people who are are placed in an opportunity to adjust their mortgage, are given the supports they need to do that. You can't simultaneously pursue a foreclosure remedy while also pursuing uh, a modification of the mortgage. That's got to stop. Third, there's got to be a single point of contact. Too many people have been flipped in ways that make it clear that you have to have one person in a company that's held accountable. You know, those Joe Nocera articles in the New York Times that looked at uh, a particular elderly homeowner, I believe she was in Queens or you know, one of the outlying uh, New York uh, counties, uh, who owned her home free and clear. 
but her, the story of how she was flipped into a note that ultimately caused her to face foreclosure is a cautionary tale. And it begins with not having one person in a company that's held accountable. And then lastly, I think the guidance that uh, Geithner and uh, the Treasury Department have issued regarding how these notes should be handled is good. I think that um, both Fannie and Freddie should adopt that guidance, and they should come in under the same proposals uh, that the Treasury Department um, has promoted. And the fact that they have refused to do that, the fact that FHFA has not taken, uh, in our view, a sufficiently uh, proactive uh, role in helping to steer uh, those two uh, entities in the right direction is troubling to me. Uh, I understand that uh, you know they played a role, and no one is attempting to somehow blame the entire crisis on the uh, management of Fannie and Freddie at all, uh, not at all. Uh, but I do think when uh, we are prepared as a uh, federal government to pay $160 million in legal fees to defend actions that were taken by uh, executives at both uh, agencies over the past several years, and not simultaneously looking at to invest a small portion of that money in redeeming the homes of people who can be saved is troubling to me. So I would hope that uh, there will be sufficient political pressure going forward to encourage the kind of proactive responses that we've seen now from the White House in coordinating an effort between both Treasury and HUD and trying to uh, involve Fannie and Freddie. And I see that as the most proactive development we've seen in some time. And again, I want to incur uh, give some credit where it's due. I think Secretary Geithner has been helpful in steering that change. Uh, and I think that should be acknowledged. But I think the leadership of people who are on the executive team, like Gene Sperling and others, has been very positive. Mm -hmm. And so we see that as a, an encouraging uh, sense of step in where we are today. So that really brings me to my last question, and then we'll open it up for some questions from uh, our folks here in the room. And uh, so both of you were starting to talk about you know, what we what we see as possible uh, coming down the pike. I mean, there are certain things that the administration can do without legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Merkley had suggested we put bankruptcy back on the table. That's budget neutral. It's, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a little bit of a lightning rod politically, but in an environment where we have no money to spend, mm -hmm. is it worth giving this another go? Uh, you know, and uh, in an, in, you know, I, I don't even have to say this, we're in the shadow of potential government shutdown. The, the partisan atmosphere is palpable. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I've, you know, uh, for some members of the House Financial Services Committee who've really gone off after Fannie and Freddie, uh, whether they uh, claim their role in, in creating foreclosures or whether it's in their future, uh, I've pointed out to them that there's a gap there in their attacks on Fannie and Freddie, and that's what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shouldn't there be uh, maybe some bipartisan ground to take a look, as Wade suggested, really going after uh, Fannie and Freddie and, and trying to figure out why they're not adopting guidance, why they're not ending dual track mm -hmm. and the like. Uh, certainly that's something I wonder as a taxpayer mm -hmm. uh, who currently owns a small share of Fannie and Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where, so what, what are our opportunities? Where do we go from here? Uh, how do we simultaneously think big uh, in the scope of the crisis, but also realistic mm -hmm. given uh, the atmosphere? You want to jump? Or you want me to jump? Well, I think, uh, I think in terms of the atmosphere on Capitol Hill, that's been accurately described. And uh, unfortunately, I think it makes it extremely unlikely that any major groundbreaking legislation in this arena is going to get adopted this year or next year. Uh, that's why one of the things we've been doing is focusing on what, are the, what can the regulatory agencies do? And uh, there are some significant steps that can be taken uh, and we have some good people in place. Uh, Sean Donovan is the, as the secretary uh, in charge of, of HUD, I think understands how these issues work, uh, has been a practitioner in the field, and uh, I think we need to move away from the, the Treasury-centric, how does this mm -hmm. affect Wall Street, and look at how does it affect average families in their homes. Uh, so, and we have a new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau which is just now being organized, will actually uh, come into full uh, uh, 
power, uh, I think it's the 21st mm -hmm. of July, the summer July of 2011. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for writing the regulations uh, about the loan servicing industry and how mortgages are managed in this country. And so I think that's the opportunity to get the kinds of reforms that uh, all of us have mentioned, Wade, the Senator, you, Janice, uh, such as ending the dual track, establish a, a single point of contact, beginning to have more of that third party review or mediation programs that will really seek uh, solutions that can work for all parties. Um, and I, th I think continued pressure on uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac makes sense. I mean, it is somewhat um, mind bending to realize that the two institutions that are essentially owned by the US government are doing so little to carry out the policies set in place by that government. And uh, part of the reason there, I think, is that we still have uh, a conservator, the, uh, the Federal Housing yeah. Financial Administration uh -huh. that's headed by an acting director, um, as is the OCC, which oversees all nationally chartered banks. Mm -hmm. Both of those are led by acting directors. I wish I had the opportunity to ask uh, the, the person at the top of the administration why we haven't gotten mm -hmm. um, a full <laughs> director named and put in place in those bodies, because that could change the yeah, kind of yeah pressure that's put on those organizations yeah. without any legislation being required. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a few ideas for starters. Yeah, thanks, Will. I, I agree completely uh, with Will's observation about the likelihood of passing new legislation. I just think that's probably not going to happen. Um, but, you know, I'm glad that Senator Merkley is looking at the bankruptcy issue, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I think the most important step that the administration could take uh, to move us in the right direction would be to nominate and seek the confirmation of Elizabeth Warren to head the Consumer Protection Bureau. Uh, I think Elizabeth Warren is an outstanding um, um, uh, academic, and I think she brings a knowledge of the government process uh, to the table in ways that I think uh, would make her tenure inspiring. Uh, that is not to say that she would not face challenge. Of course she would. Uh, but having said that, I think we can get beyond the challenge if the administration is committed to her confirmation. So I hope the administration will consider that. Secondly, I think the bankruptcy fix is an important tool. And because it is revenue neutral, it should be back on the table as something to debate. But guys, we kid ourselves. If we think that you can get that through unless we are organized effectively at the ground level to make a difference. And what makes a difference are the compelling stories of real people in districts that are being affected adversely by the current process. We need to have stories of people who are facing foreclosure and whose stories are so compelling because the individuals deserve to hold on to their home and could do so with some support. But those stories have not been adequately developed and presented, and they need to be taken to the members' offices in their districts so that they can get a taste firsthand of what the current process is doing to people who vote for them and who are in their state and need their support. So I think that's a missing ingredient. And I think that the strategy for a bankruptcy bill requires a massive ground game. It also requires a grass tops game. And I don't think any of the groups collectively are up to the task right now. I just don't, I haven't seen it. While it could, I think, be done, it would require a massive effort to make that happen. I do think that Fannie and Freddie are at the heart of this, but I also think that they are easily scapegoated. And members, uh, particularly now in the House leadership, have sort of used them as a whipping post mm -hmm. to justify you know, a failure to resolve these policy changes in ways that can make a difference. And I think that um, you know, Mr. DeMarco, who heads FHFA, uh, should certainly uh, be asked to examine these issues, and not in a way that seeks to violate uh, the independence of his role or responsibility. But I'm looking for some transparency. I'm looking for a better understanding of how the judgments behind decisions not to adopt the Treasury Department guidance are made, when in fact it's quite clear on the face of it that that guidance could provide a useful um, uh, effort in moving forward to coordinate a response that can make a difference. So I think that there has to be greater transparency uh, among some of the oversight organizations. I feel the same way about the OCC. Uh, and, and certainly, we have had meetings in the past with members of at every level 
of the stage, including uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, and Chairman Bernanke has actually been quite uh, accessible and willing to talk about these issues. Now, what they can do at the Federal Reserve is relatively limited. So in looking at how to coordinate this effort, I think the uh, CFPB is the place to go, and that's the Consumer Fe uh, Bureau. And I think Elizabeth Warren is the person to head it. And I think there are other appointments that could be made for these acting positions to help transform this by putting people in positions of responsibility who have the public interest at heart. And I think we know and can identify several of them. So that's my point. Yeah, I think the um, way you mentioned transparency, uh, you know, when it comes to FHFA as well as Fannie and Freddie, mm -hmm. and I think that's critical, especially for so many of us who have been working with borrowers in the field, uh, as well as here inside the Beltway, I mean, the, the finger pointing is really enough to just, you know, to just make you want to bang your head against the wall, right? You know, when you, you talk to the banks, they say, well, we can't do it because Fannie and Freddie won't allow us. Fannie and Freddie tell us it's FHFA. FHFA tells us it's Treasury. Treasury tells us their hands are tied. You can't get all of them in the same room, and we can never get a clear answer about exactly where the breakdowns are, which, as you lay out, is critical to actually shaping the policy in a way that it's actually going to be effective. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, if we can get some more transparency there, I think it really will move the ball forward. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to pick up on is the importance of field. And I think you're exactly right uh, that uh, we've not seen a concentrated ground game here. Certainly NCLR's focus is shifting to the field. We Tomorrow we'll launch our Home for Good campaign where we're really going to try uh, to engage our affiliates in collecting those kinds of stories, but we, there's no way that NCLR is going to be able to move no. this dial by ourselves. No. We're going to, it's going to take a lot of organizations coming to the table and doing that. And I dare say that, you know, I don't know that uh, it, Treasury is used to this kind of pressure. I'm, I'm looking forward to really peppering <laughs> them with the types of yeah. uh, grassroots advocacy that we normally reserve for uh, our elected officials. <laughs> Appointees don't generally get that kind, those kinds of phone calls. But, uh, you know, the... Um, to create the kind of political will that we need in order to move the ball forward, it's going to take concerted effort from the field. And this brings me actually full circle to uh, trouble around burnout. And part of the problem is that our families are so down and out. Our practitioners that are serving families are down and out. NCLR did a survey of our housing counselors last year, and we found that a significant portion of our housing counselors, who generally reflect the demographic that they're serving, are also facing foreclosure, mm -hmm. usually because their own hours have been cut or because a spouse or partner or family yes. member has lost their job. So we're, you know, we're asking folks to mobilize who are really, uh, you know, it <coughs> least capable, of, or not least capable sure. of doing so, but, you know, face their, their own challenges. So that's, uh, you know, um, a critical uh, uh, hurdle for us at the national level with, uh, and those working on the ground to overcome. Uh, but, you know, I think goes back to your point, Wait, on terms of money, power, influence, that story's been told. <laughs> Yeah, no, just a, just a quick addendum, uh, and thank you, Janice. I completely agree with what you said. Look, I, uh, I think, and I want to leave people with an accurate impression, I think the Treasury Department, since its early days, has become more proactive and more helpful in trying to resolve this problem. Mm -hmm. So I no longer see Treasury as an impediment. They were early on. I don't see them as an impediment today. Mm -hmm. And I think Geithner gets it. I, I think Geithner would like to move the needle forward. There's only so much that he can do within the powers that he has without appearing to overreach. Having said that, I do think that FHFA is a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Fannie and Freddie are uh, being held back from what they could do to help facilitate this effort. I think that's a really important piece to identify. And I also think that the White House is stepping up a campaign to coordinate more effectively uh, between the federal agencies that have some jurisdiction or responsibility over this. So I think they're working with Treasury. I think they're working with HUD. I think Secretary Donovan certainly has the right spirit uh, about what can be done. But I also think that more, tra uh, more transparency is necessary. The last piece goes back to this ground game. Uh, in, in the past, um, housing uh, activists and counselors and, and those of us working on foreclosure to some degree have worked within a silo 
of mm -hmm. only those people who share our concern and point of view. That's an important element, but it's not enough to transform and change policy unless you are also either investing substantial resources in a campaign or you're able to break out of that silo and create a multi-unified uh, a, 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 a multi group that includes organized labor, includes um, you know, people who are first responders, includes civil and human rights groups, includes the elderly, includes women's organizations. They all have a stake here. And our job is to connect the dots by helping to show them what's at stake for the constituencies they represent and to get them to mobilize across these silos so that they can emphasize and use greater leverage and greater influence. And it has to be done both at the grass tops level and it's got to be done at the grassroots level. And I think there are those of us uh, who are beginning to look in those terms. Obviously, we're looking to you. We're looking to the NAACP. We're looking uh, to various unions who are engaged in this effort. And if we can knit together a uh, coalition of coalitions, then I think we can have some impact on this. I think that's exactly right. And, and I also just want to echo your comments that I have uh, been impressed and very excited to see the uh, – see all these issues really ramp up at the White House mm -hmm. and them to step in and uh, make uh, take a, a larger role in trying to coordinate between the agencies and I think that's very promising so I could I could continue I've got at least a hundred more questions <laughs> for you guys but I'm sensing that there's probably some questions in the audience as well we've I think got about 20 minutes for questions so uh, folks looks like we have one here I know we have a microphone so if we could uh, hold on the microphone? Uh, wait, you, you were talking about the, y your your opinion about Treasury had changed, and, and maybe I I, I, mm -hmm. I was trying to understand what is it that they've done specifically recently in terms of policy or some action that gives you well, hope that they have changed. played. Sure, and I appreciate the question. I think they have played uh, behind the scenes a more effective role in helping to coordinate. Uh, activity initially by uh, meeting with a variety of different voices it obviously includes uh, some of the banking community and services but also some of us who are advocates I think um, Secretary Geithner himself has taken on a hands-on role in, in those discussions I think that's been very good I think that uh, with the support of uh, Secretary Donovan uh, he too has been able to encourage a greater coordination between between Treasury and HUD uh, to work with uh, those of us in the uh, NGO community, civil and human rights community, to try to come up uh, with strategies to move these issues forward. I think the White House has now also seen uh, the importance of coordinating an effort in this regard, because obviously it has impact on the greater uh, you know, debate on the economy and where we're going, and I see all of those things as positive. The four areas that uh, we sort of isolated, the unemployment payments and and uh, you know the, the dual track issues and so forth. I think there are strategies being developed to encourage movement. I think um, you know were we to articulate some of those that they would be dead on arrival. So I'll keep them to ourselves for now. But I think that uh, I've seen encouraging signs, and I think that uh, you know we should acknowledge that. I, I was critical of the Treasury Department uh, early on for scuttling the bankruptcy fix, and I want to be equally accurate in my uh, recognition of uh, policy changes that I think are moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question over here? Hi, my name is Melvin Tabilas with the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American C Community Development or National Capacity. I understand that with the latest uh, budget agreement, um, housing counseling will be zeroed out. Um, what this means for national capacity as well as, uh, w w which is a HUD uh, housing counseling intermediary as well as other organizations like NCLR, uh, our, our housing counseling fund will probably co be coming from banks and the GSC. So I wanted to, to check in with you guys to see uh, are there plans to address this? Uh, Janice? Well, <laughs> we certainly have plans. I'm not sure if they're the same plans that Will will have. Uh, so let me comment on that. Um, we, we have definitely seen an assault on uh, federal programs of all shapes and sizes, but certainly the foreclosure prevention programs in the name of uh, small government and reducing the deficit. 
NCLR did take a strong stance on HAMP uh, because we think it actually was standing in the way of us getting to stronger solutions. That's not the feeling of all of my colleagues, but that was one that we took. Uh, that's the only one we took, though. However, we've supported all the other foreclosure prevention mm -hmm. programs, and I think it sends exactly the wrong signal to our communities at this point to try to take away uh, funding for what's probably been one of the most effective programs, dollar for dollar, the foreclosure prevention program. And I actually am I'm going to uh, disagree with you just a little bit that I don't know that w when you say we'll have to get our money from banks and the GSEs, I'm not sure that actually happens. If you take away our federal funding, mm -hmm. our ability to leverage private dollars uh, will likely go away. I mean, I think if without federal funding, we have no uh, foreclosure prevention program, uh, housing uh, foreclosure prevention counselors, which we know are really the only free, nonprofit, uh, objective third-party advocate that a family can get to help them knock on the door of a servicer that they otherwise are getting tossed out of. So it's, it's <coughs> devastating and certainly something that we're uh, prepared to go to the mat for to fight for. I would agree with that. The work done by the housing counselors across the country has been essential because uh, the, the average uh, family struggling to keep their mortgage doesn't understand these complex rules. Uh, they're under a lot of uh, emotional stress and financial stress to begin with. They need someone who knows how the program works, knows who to call, has uh, experience with this to work alongside them. So we're, we are not going to stand by to see those programs defunded. Uh, I know there were a lot of uh, deep, deep cuts contained in H.R. 1 when it passed the House of Representatives. Uh, many of those cuts would not make it through the Senate. Uh, and as for the budget negotiations that were just concluded, uh, we still haven't seen all the line item detail in terms of how that's going to work out. So uh, I, I can't confirm uh, what funding level may be there for housing counseling, but yeah. I know Senator Merkley is going to be there fighting to sustain that funding because we've seen how effective it is in Oregon and, and I've heard similar stories from colleagues around the country. Yeah, no, I agree with, with, with both of my colleagues. I, I guess I would just say this. Um, I'm not detecting a sufficient um, willingness to fight back among constituencies that would be most affected by these cuts. Uh, the idea that housing counselors would be cut and that we would roll over and let that happen is discouraging to me. Uh, because the truth is, uh, we, ha we have the information about how important these counselors are. As a matter of fact, we've taken the position that counselors should be given extended authority to help make modifications more quickly and resolve the bottleneck that exists between those who get uh, these uh, you know, temporary modifications and those who get permanent modifications. And the counselors who are certified by HUD should be able to help make those decisions and resolve the bottleneck. So taking them out of the process was not ever considered. In fact, giving them greater responsibility should really be our push. I think that the civil rights community, the housing community, labor, et cetera, all the people we talked about, should be coordinating a fight back campaign. What is it that we don't understand about the requirement to fight back? And I would just assert as an example, uh, my friends at Planned Parenthood. I mean, Cecile Richards uh, at Planned Parenthood is a member of the leadership conference. I'm very proud of what they do. And I stood up with them last week when they did their rally on Capitol Hill, and they pushed back. And the idea that you would cut a deal that would put women's health uh, at risk in terms of uh, you know this this nonsensical budget uh, set of cuts, and that we wouldn't fight back was unthinkable. I want to bring that same energy to the fight around housing and housing counselors. So don't ask what we're going to do when they take the money. Say they're not going to take the money and stand <laughs> up and make that a reality. And then lastly, don't look uh, to the Senate to be a firewall. I mean, that's ridiculous, guys. The Senate will cave in a heartbeat. I mean, I love them, you know, but they will cave. All too Don't well. set them up to cave. You've got to be your own firewall. And then hopefully give them the backing and the heart they need from people like Senator Merkley and others. And the end of, at the end of the day, the solution may well be 
to change the Senate rules, as Senator Merkley and others tried to do at the start of the session, mm -hmm. and that we're going to be doing pushing real hard to do at the next session. And I think that you know, drawing markers in the sand to let people know how you're going to respond to this is important. And last point, I didn't mention the FDIC in all of this. The FDIC has been the one shining light in terms of uh, agencies that have been responding. Now, full disclosure, I serve on an advisory board for economic inclusion. It's a non-paying position, guys, at the FDIC. But I really admire Sheila Bear. I think she's terrific. And I think what she has done as a regulator is commendable. And this isn't about partisanship. This is about a recognition that when good work is done, you have to lift it up and salute it. So FDIC has been a shining light. Now, the others you can keep. But I think in terms of <laughs> <laughs> this agency, they're good. OK, I think we've got time for probably one more question. One, two, Could one, you three. address the issue of second liens? and mm -hmm. what that means in this whole process, because mm -hmm. I understand that that's a major stumbling block. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would completely agree with you. Uh, as I think everybody in the room uh, would know, a sec oh, the, oh, the question was, thank you. Uh, the question was, could you address the problem of second liens with regard to uh, homeowners that are in trouble on their mortgage? And uh, so a second lien refers to a second mortgage that a family may have taken out. It might be one that they took out subsequent to uh, getting their loan and they took out a home equity line to do other things. Or uh, more recently, it was actually a second part of the initial financing where you'd have an 80% loan and then maybe a 10% loan and, or a 20% loan and, and the balance in a small down payment. The reason that the second lien is such a problem is that you often can't modify the first mortgage unless the second lien holder agrees, even though that second lien holder may in fact have no equity whatsoever because the house is only worth 75% of what the loan is and the first lien has the rights to 80% of what the first loan is. Nonetheless, that second lien holder does have uh, the authority to approve or disapprove a modification. And to further complicate that, more than half of the second liens are owned by the largest four banks in the country who service most of the loans. And as I think all of you are aware, it's those loan servicers that control the decision making on the loan modification process. So that's where uh, we get a real uh, amount of friction thrown in where instead we need some lubrication. And uh, so for example, in uh, in Oregon's pilot program that Senator Merkley has worked on, um, one of the things we're using that money for is to say we're going to we're going to get rid of those second liens. We're going to uh, to use some of that funding to buy down those second liens, not at their par value, but uh, according to formula where it might be a nickel or a dime per dollar to get it out of the way so that you can actually go ahead and reform that first. Uh, mortgage because what we really should have done back when the 50 billion dollars was pledged in 2009 is to say let's go out and buy 50 dollars 50 billion dollars in troubled mortgages we will own them and then we can go uh, go ahead and on our own have the authority to modify those loans but we didn't take that ambitious a stance uh, let me ask if my colleagues have other thoughts about second liens no i think you did well, let me uh, go ahead and wrap up. Obviously, I think we could uh, continue talking. I know there's probably still some additional questions in the audience. Like I said, I've, I have hundreds. But um, it's, you know, we, I, I hope, painted a picture of the challenges that we're facing. I hope it wasn't too gloomy and reflective of the weather outside. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm going to punt to read, and I think our second panel is going to bring uh, is a little bit more uplifting because <laughs> uh, they're going to share with you some um, some promising strategies uh, some of which are out in the field actually are working and hopefully we can uh, think about bringing those up to scale so I want to thank uh, my colleagues up here on the panel thank uh, the questions we got from the audience thank you thank you
Uh, this is where you can stretch uh, and uh, bear with us for a moment or two as we uh, change seats up here. We'll get started the uh, next panel with uh, Thank you. Uh, let's see. Teaching this term? I am. Yeah. Um, Almost done then with the. Uh, yeah, I've got to start grading. Dra dra right. The hardest part is actually drafting exams and grading. Right. The drafting actually takes some thought, and the grading is mindless and is the worst part of the job. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, and, and there's no one to help you with that. No, we're not allowed, by ABA rules, we're not allowed okay. to have our uh, yeah. TAs uh, do it. You don't have a PowerPoint, do you? I, did, I didn't prepare okay, one. Okay, good. I don't know why this came down, because I don't think we. Uh, I, I do we enjoy have using it as kind of a, as a crutch, but oh, yeah, I always tell people uh, to avoid. Them. Oh, okay, good. Uh, all right. A lot of you met Adam before? Uh, no, actually not. Adam was here. Nice to meet you. I've read, well, I can't say I've read everything you've written because it's should. a lot of stuff. Um, but I've read what I have read. It's great. All right, we're going to take our seats now up here, and I invite you all to do the same. Uh, for those that are hiding in the back, you can come forward a bit and fill in. So this is for you. You have a yes. friend. Um, <laughs> there are coffee and danishes still out there to avail yourselves of, um, but hopefully it's so you can stay with us here and, and come back in. And I invite you to join us up here. Um, and we'll just keep plowing away here. So really, thanks for, uh, for being here. And, and uh, a lot of the issues uh, that we want to highlight on this panel, specific policy ideas have been, have been uh, referenced in, in the discussion this morning. And we're going to dig in a bit uh, deeper uh, with a little bit more clarity, uh, because th there are a number of excellent ideas uh, for mitigating the foreclosure crisis um, that merit greater attention um, and uh, I think some of the policy goals that we need to identify and strive to achieve uh, are around keeping people in their homes, uh, preventing mass displacement, 
and stabilizing neighborhoods that have really been uh, rocked by the financial crisis, the recession, and the foreclosure situation. Uh, really, foreclosures are a, this lose-lose-lose proposition. Um, you know, the family is displaced, the bank owns the property, they don't always uh, maintain it, put them back on the market. Renters that are in foreclosed properties have fewer rights and are often at an increased threat of uh, eviction. Uh, when the bank owns the property, they don't pay taxes. Um, there's a drag on adjacent property values. Um, so a number of situations that I think that need, need to be addressed. Um, and, and we need to pursue some alternatives. So we've got really an excellent panel here uh, to focus on what some of the most promising ideas uh, are. Uh, their full bios are in your uh, packets, um, but let me introduce them to you briefly uh, in the order of their uh, appearance before you. Um, Adam uh, Levitin is Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, he writes on a number of consumer protection issues. He writes a lot on bankruptcy uh, uh, reform. Uh, and so he's going to tell us um, how it can make a difference. I call it cram down. Uh, some people don't like that term. He'll tell us if, it, if I should care what we call it or how it might work. Um, then uh, uh, Alon Cohen uh, is the author of this uh, foreclosure mediation series that has been uh, published by the Center for American um, Progress. Uh, he's really drawn a lot of attention uh, with some of his colleagues um, to the foreclosure process and how if we increase the chances uh, for mortgage to be renegotiated, one way to do this is to get people talking, uh, lenders, owners. Uh, and we found out, he's found out, that when, when people talk, um, it, it works. And um, there's some real things that are, that are real value in this process. And it, it, we should be looking for ways to integrate it automatically as a matter of course into the process. Uh, then Miriam Axel Lute um, is uh, the Associate Director of the National Housing Institute. Uh, she recently wrote uh, an article in Shelter Force magazine where she's an editor uh, on the potential of lease purchase agreements and rent to own arrangements. And she's now focusing a lot of attention on the concept of, of this mortgage um, resolution funds that bring in third parties to kind of act as stewards to help renegotiate terms and keep people in place. And then finally, Jim Carr is uh, Chief Business Officer of, of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Uh, he's written on a number of foreclosure uh, mitigation strategies and neighborhood stabilization strategies. They had a, issued a report he was a co-author of in the fall um, that looked at uh, a lot of these things in, in detail. So he's going to offer his perspective and uh, tell us what might uh, come next. So they're each going to speak for about 10 minutes, uh, then we'll have a discussion and, and include all of you. Um, I'll kind of uh, moderate from the front row, and you'll go in sequence, and then I'll pop back up and I'll moderate the uh, Q&A. So, uh, Adam. Well, thank you for having me here today, Reed. I'm going to be talking a little bit about what, what I think is a, was a missed opportunity, uh, namely the possibility of using uh, fe uh, federal bankruptcy courts as a way to try and straighten out uh, troubled mortgages. And I say it was a missed opportunity, but it's still one that, that could be effective, even though I, I really don't think there's much of a chance of it moving politically through Congress at any point in the near future, absent an utter crisis. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that using bankruptcy courts as a way to reform mortgages is just one tool in the toolbox. It's, uh, it's not necessarily... I, I would not advocate it as the sole response. So in the, here's our problem. In the wake of the housing bubble, we need the market to, the, the housing market to clear. And that means we want buyers and sellers to be able to meet and agree on prices. And that's the way a healthy market works. Problem is that's not what's happening. That we still, we have some private sales happening, but the, the numbers are way down. And um, if you think of it, the problem that's getting in the way for uh, the market clearing are mortgages. And this is because mortgages have a due on, uh, all, every mortgage has a due on sale clause in it that says that if you sell the property, you've got to pay back the lender. So, and if you don't pay back the lender, then the, the more of the lien is still on the property. So whoever's buying the property is buying it subject to a lien, and the debt, but the debt is owed by the seller who's not going to pay. So if the, uh, that means that if you're the new, the new purchaser, you'd have to be paying off that entire debt, uh, and that's not happening. 
So there, you know, there are some ways we can get around this, right? Um, we could do, you know, short re short re refinancings, and we we've seen a couple of proposals for that. So first we had um, the uh, Hope for Homeowners proposal, which uh, was part of the the hair of the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, and I think that's they've done around, you know, maybe a hundred refinancings under that. Um, really, it's one of the most abysmal failures on on, on record. Uh, then we have the we have now the the souped up um, uh, version of it, which is the FHA short refi program, and that uh, it seems like that might be a little more promising, but it still it, it hasn't been turning out big numbers. Um, we'll see, you know, maybe that will change with time. The other uh, another possibility would have been short sales. So, um, and if we had done short sales, the, this would have been that the 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 the, uh, the lender would have said, I'll accept less than the full amount owed on the property, uh, full amount of the mortgage. Uh, when you sell the property, the problem is that lenders are very suspicious of short sales because they always think that they're get, that they're getting cheated in some way, and as a result, one of our largest financial institutions um, uh, apparently last year denied 30,000 short sales, and if you kind of extrapolate from their market share, that we're looking at maybe 150 to 200,000 short sales that were denied last year, but that's not the whole picture there because if you take it another step, you say well. If, short, if that many short sales are being denied, it has a chilling effect on the market. Because who organize, who, ha, who does the short sale? Well, yeah, you need a real estate broker who's handling it. And brokers only get paid when the deal closes. A broker puts in just as much, if not more, work on doing a short sale than on a regular sale. And if brokers think they're not going to get paid, they're reluctant to even, to even uh, talk with clients about doing a short sale. So where does this leave us? Um, well, we don't really have a good market clearing mechanism. That the normal ways that we would want markets to clear of having parties just meet and agree on prices isn't happening because the, the mortgages are getting in the way. And instead, we're, uh, we're seeing the market clear through foreclosures. And foreclosures are an absolutely terrible market clearing mechanism. It's a foreclo the foreclosure market's a very inefficient market. It's slow, and it's only getting slower that robo-signing and all everything kind of stemming out of that has just put lots and lots of sand in the uh, in the gears of the foreclosure machinery. Uh, there's a possibility that the, uh, that foreclosures result in the market overclearing because not many people ever show up to bid on a foreclosure sale, so we actually can get overly depressed prices. And then, as uh, you've already heard today, there are lots and lots of externalities of uh, sort of n negative side effects from foreclosures. So there are uh, effects on neighbors' properties, for example. That property values tend to be correlated with with neighboring property values, and when a house goes into foreclosure, off uh, or the the homeowner defaults, often they stop taking care of the property. They don't water the lawn, they don't mow the lawn, and you know they, you see the house with the brown lawn next to next ne, next to yours, and that means your property value is sinking. There, this has effects then on municipal and state tax revenues because property values go down, property tax revenue goes down, and thus the state's ability to offer services is reduced. We also have uh, just greater strains on services because uh, foreclosed properties often become vacant and they become locuses of crime, of arson, and even public health problems, actually. Um, that there's a California Department of Public Health study that uh, correlates um, increased cases of West Nile virus with foreclosures because you have all these empty, these swimming pools that are not being taken care of and, you know, you, the kind of the green stagnant water filled with mosquitoes, right? Okay. So that's all. That's all by way of background. So one of the uh, one proposal for dealing with this uh, with this problem was to allow the modification of mortgages in bankruptcy. Bankruptcy law is, uh, is federal law, and uh, bankruptcy courts routinely restructure all kinds of debts, consumer debts and business debts. And this means that they uh, can, will change interest rates. They will extend the term of the debt. They will change adjustable rate debts to fixed rate and vice versa. They'll change amortization schedules, and they will even uh, reduce the principal that is owed to the value of the property. Now, I put a little asterisk next to that because it's the technical. Technically, what happens is a little more complicated, but for kind of basic discussion purposes, that think of it as just principal values being reduced to the value of the, pro uh, of the property. And bankruptcy courts can do this for airplanes, for yachts, for apartment buildings, for vacation homes, for homes where you lease out the basement or the attic. They can do this for, you know, equipment and inventory and accounts receivable, but they can't do this for single-family principal residences. That's the one type of property that bankruptcy courts cannot mess with. They can't mess with it with a mortgage on single-family principal residence. 
And this, uh, the history of this is a little, uh, is a little strange. It's not that uh, Congress never really ever articulated a policy for why it was doing this. It used to be that bankruptcy courts couldn't uh, were more restricted were restricted in lots of other areas. Congress liberalizes other areas, but this one area remained. And uh, kind of the history of this and the congressional record is simply not very clear. That there, um, we get some statements from uh, Senator Domenici. Deme, De, uh, being a little dubious about this when, when uh, some SNL industry lobbyists raised this at hearings, and that's about all we see. Um, so, one of the, the we had a proposal we had a proposal to allow uh, to amend the bankruptcy code to allow modifications of mortgages on single family principal residences, and this includes a reduction of principal, which is what uh, Reed referred to earlier as cram down. Um, cram down is, as, as a bank as a bankruptcy attorney is a little disconcerting to hear in this context because it has a completely different meaning when dealing with Chapter 11 bankruptcies. But that's the term that got started to get used. And, it, you know, it, it sounds a little nasty. Um, that it, it, and, and I think it's the sense that you're kind of cramming this deal down the throats of the, of the creditors. Um, and that may, you know, I'm not sure how that played publicly. I know, I know my mother thought that was a nice thing. She's like, yeah, stick it to him. Um, so I guess it, it depends on the audience. Uh, you can, um, but it, needless to say, the, the uh, modification of mortgages in bankruptcy would have been an involuntary modification of mortgages. It would not have been negotiated with lenders. This would have been a take it or leave it deal for lenders. And so creditors would not have gotten a say on whether this would be done as long as the uh, proposed modification would have complied with various legal requirements. Now, as legislation mo moved forward, we saw that there were, you know, it, it came with lots and lots of limitations, such as which mortgages would be eligible for this, and maybe most importantly, the possibility of shared appreciation. So property values went back up in the future, lenders would recapture some of that. The idea of, uh, of modifying mortgages in, in bankruptcy would have dealt with several, several serious problems. The, um, an unwillingness to negotiate problem, a capacity to negotiate problem, that mortgage servicers simply don't have the capacity to handle all, all the foreclosures coming in. It would have dealt with uh, problems with the servicers having bad incentives that Reed described foreclosures as lose, lose, lose. Well, it's lose, 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 sometimes win. Um, that mortgage servicers don't have a stake in the uh, performance of the mortgage the way that lenders do. And sometimes they can do better in foreclosure than they do in, in with a modification. So it would have dealt with this kind of misaligned agent problem. Um, it would have also de dealt with second liens. It would have wiped those out. And it would have dealt with the problems of um, terms, uh, securitization terms that, that restrict mortgage modification. Now, there were a lot of concerns about cram down. Or, um, and I'm using cram down as kind of the broad rubric here. There were concerns about judicial uh, judges doing valuation. Well, bankruptcy judges do this all the time. And banks don't complain about this. Generally, but you know that's the, that's something you can get around. You can have third-party uh, appraisers do valuations, and frankly, valuation is just a guess compounded by a guess. Um, there's not; it's not a science. Um, there were concerns that you know the banks would have to uh, take immediately immediate re loss recognition uh, if uh, if lots of people started filing for bankruptcy. Okay, that way that was a particular problem back in let's say fall of 2008. On the other hand. We, are, we knew at that point the banks were insolvent and that they needed capital injections. So, you know, what would be a few more billion dollars? I'm not sure. Um, there were also uh, concerns about moral hazard. And moral hazard is, you know, the, is the uh, concern that if, you offer, that if you offer someone a benefit, they're, it's going to induce them to engage in some undesirable behavior. So if you say, uh, I will, I'll modify your mortgage. If you're in default, it will call, lead people to default in order to get mortgage modifications. Um, the problem is actually bankruptcy does a really good job in dealing with moral hazard compared with anything else that we have around. It may not be perfect, but it's pretty good. So typical moral hazard situation is insurance, where we're worried that if we insure people, uh, if people auto insurance, they're going to be reckless drivers. And our, our solution to that is to require co-payments, to require deductibles, to have uh, limitations on coverage, and also that your premiums will go up in the future. Uh, bankruptcy kind of does, gets at that, that uh, you know, it's going to affect your credit score. This would have been Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is a repayment plan. You'd be living on a budget, a court-supervised budget, for the next three to five years. So if, you, if little Timmy needs braces, you're going to the bankruptcy judge to argue that that's essential, that little Timmy gets braces. And if little Lisa needs piano lessons, you're going to be haggling with, with creditors about that. Not a fun thing. Um, 
it would mean that your finances would be in the public records, and uh, this could affect your future employment. And there's just, frankly, a shame factor that a lot of people have with filing for bankruptcy. So this wouldn't have been costless, and that would have helped deal with, with the moral hazard concern. Um, there's also kind of a sanctity of contracts concern, but, uh, and I can speak longer about this. Um, I, I, I see my time's running out here. But uh, let me just say, contracts aren't suicide pacts. Um, it's important that we enforce them generally, but we have certain exceptions where we don't enforce contracts. We don't enforce contracts for murder. We don't enforce contracts for prostitution. We don't enforce contracts made or under duress. And I'd say that we probably have an exception for contracts that cause really bad social problems. And in the past, the U.S. government has itself uh, sort of sh uh, shut off contracts. So um, during the Depression, with the Roosevelt administration's solution, or uh, one of their solutions to, to the Depression, was to try and inflate its way out. And the problem was that um, public and private bonds tended to be indexed, uh, have a gold indexation as an anti-inflation device. Well, Congress passed a law abrogating those gold clauses. And what do you think markets did? They rallied. And then when the Supreme Court upheld that, those, uh, that, that abrogation, markets rallied again. And this is, you know, just so you know the source of that, of, of that that's coming from Randall Cro a study by Randall Cro Krosner, a former Federal Reserve governor who was a Bush appointee. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that when we have, a, when we have a, a type of contract that actually causes deep social problems, I think actually we may see a case where markets want to see a grown-up in the room saying, we're not going to, we're not going to enforce these re you know, really socially harmful types of contracts. So you know, in conclusion, um, bankruptcy wouldn't have been a silver bullet. It, could, it can't deal with unemployment. And not everyone who, ne who would have needed help would have filed. But it would have helped deal with problems like second liens, like ser bad servicer incentives, lack of servicer capacity, restrictions in pooling and servicing agreements, and it would have provided an incentive for parties to negotiate because this would have been a stick that, uh, bar that uh, borrowers would have had to say, either you cut a good deal with me now or you can see, you know, I'll see you in bankruptcy court. And the, the, the alternative that borrowers have is simply to say, well, I'm going to default. Uh, actually, I'm already in default. And uh, if you don't cut a deal with me, well, you get the house. But that's, you know, that's not, a gr that's not really the deal we want to see. Um, you know, there are ways I think we could have improved the, the proposals in the, for, a cha for modifying Chapter 13. I think we probably needed to do this in a much more streamlined, cookie-cutter way to make it just you know, easier to understand and more administratively pr uh, practicable. And you know, hopefully after the next election, we'll see that the, that, the, that the political constellation has realigned. But I, I think this was really a bit of a missed opportunity for us. The uh, the subject of foreclosure mediation is our next stop. When uh, I told my wife that I was speaking here today, she said, how long are you talking about mediation? Um, that, by the way, was my eight-minute timer. That way I won't go over 10. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's not a – that's me talking too much. I told my wife I was talking about mediation for eight minutes. She said, really? And I said, yeah. And she gave me this look like, you're not serious. And I turned on ESPN, and they happen to be spending at least that long on NFL Live talking about mediation in the NFL Players Association context. So – they can, if sports fans can stay enthralled, I think I've got a shot. Um, mediation's also not a silver bullet. Uh, it is, I think, as you'll find from all the solutions up here, a constellation of solutions that are necessary to address a very big problem. Uh, I think I have fallen into this, and many of us have fallen into this, the idea that we have a difficult problem, but if we're willing to solve it, we put in place the solution, then the problem is solved. And that's sort of like saying, I'd really like to build a house tomorrow. And we all sit around, we take a decision and expect to walk out onto the lot and see a house tomorrow. We all understand intuitively that you have to build it. And that's, that's part of the problem here. And that's why um, I've been studying this particular section of this crisis for about three years now. And we're still seeing evolution in it. And we'll continue to see it. Mediation, to start at the beginning, is two parties coming into a room in the presence of a neutral third party to have a conversation, uh, usually with the intent of settlement. That third party is oftentimes a subject matter expert, so they'll, in this case, know something about foreclosure. They'll know something about real estate. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you're going to Philadelphia, you'll oftentimes find that your mediator is a commercial real estate attorney. They happen to know most of the space and have learned about the residential part to be the mediator. The key thing to know about foreclosure mediation, which is a mediation that happens right after or right before a foreclosure is filed when the two parties sit down, is that mediation never tells the parties they have to settle. That is what makes it all the more surprising than that when over half the time people sit down to talk, they do settle. 
uh, in some instances, it's as much as three quarters of the time. The reason that they settle is, I think Adam did a very good job of explaining why the sort of damage that uh, foreclosures can have on communities. For the two parties themselves, they often find that it's a good deal. Why is that? Uh, well, the market clearing mechanisms that Adam described have been extremely inefficient, and that means uh, that in addition to the bad incentives that you've got on the servicer side, uh, basically shops that are built to foreclose, getting people to talk about a deal that could be better for both sides, the homeowner and the servicer, uh, or the lender or the investors, is something that they weren't built to do. And when they finally get a chance to do it, uh, they find that they can do better in any sort of negotiated settlement than they could do at foreclosure. Not the least of which, or not the least of which reason is the fact that we've had such a depressed housing market and the housing crisis has continued for so long. The things that foreclosure mediation permits us uh, right now as opportunities is as a appeals process to, for example, HAMP or to proprietary modifications. A lot of this concept of second looks of independent review has found its way into many other solutions to this crisis, not the least of which, again, is the AG settlement. Uh, it's actually uh, part of congressional, congressional legislation pertaining to bankruptcy proceedings as well. Certain courts in the Southern District of New York and Rhode Island have simply said to the parties, you know, we can't modify your principal residence, but that's the biggest asset on the table. So go into that room and figure something out and then come back and tell us what you can pay your creditors after you actually have an, an asset you can afford. And again, those have been successful. There's been pushback to say, well, isn't that effectively a cram down? And the answer again is no. It just happens to be that when you sit parties in a room together, they will find a solution if it's better for the both of them. And it turns out that more than half the time it is. Uh, the interesting thing there, of course, is that bankruptcy judges, like all federal judges, should already have the discretion to direct any case they want uh, to an alternative dispute resolution mechanism, which is the umbrella term for mediation, arbitration, things like that. So they should already have the power to do this. Congress just wants to clarify this. Foreclosure mediation works. It's got a settlement rate in mature programs, mature programs being ones that have done this for a little while. They're up to speed. Everybody's trained. They have a workflow of about uh, three out of every four. Uh, that includes people who both settle and stay in their homes. That's over 60% of settlements in places like Connecticut and Philadelphia, and short sales and deeds in lieu of foreclosure where the homeowner settles both parties see better value out of that. The homeowner gets better control uh, over the process, occasionally gets something called cash for keys, which is I need money to go find a new home. And they say, great. Um, and they settle on a date. And that, that's that extra about 14 or 15 percent. Mediation was long thought to be uh, a risk factor for extending the process. Turns out that mediation sessions, uh, excuse me, mediation doesn't just last one session. That was the original hope, right? We'll get everybody in a room. This is like building a house, right? We'll get everybody in a room. We'll settle your mortgage tomorrow. And it didn't happen that way. And it's really not surprising when you think about the complexity of the process, the difficulty people have passing back and forth documents. So mediation averages about 2.2 sessions. It's also a lot shorter than foreclosure. And if you, most programs today run foreclosure and mediation at the same time. So foreclosure stop, uh, excuse me, if mediation stops the process early, you just save that time. Foreclosure in, uh, on average is about 250 days. Uh, foreclosure mediation, ends one way or the other in about 90 to 100 days. Talking about cutting it on average in more than half. It's also growing. State foreclosure mediation programs were 11 in 2009. 22 when I was here uh, at the end of 2010, we've added Washington, Vermont. Um, there are programs that are coming online in Delaware that were already pre-existing, but we're just taking their time to ramp up. So we're at about 24 states in DC, uh, which is about to make its program permanent. The type of foreclosure mediation uh, that I've been speaking about for a while now is uh, a foreclosure mediation regime that is automatic. And what that means is current programs most of the time are opt-in. Homeowner gets a notice. Homeowner has to send back a, a letter that says, I want to participate in the program. In any opt-in regime that we've ever seen, no matter what it is from a public policy perspective, participation is always about, max is out at about one-fifth. Sometimes it's much lower than that. Uh, when you flip that and you say opt out of things, we as human beings, just as a behavioral matter, tend to, in a difficult decision, just go with the, with the, um, the automatic decision and people just simply opt in 80% of the time instead of opting in 20%, excuse me, they opt out 20% of the time versus opting in 20% of the time. So participation goes way up. 
the thing we've learned as we've studied that is as participation goes up, it's not like you had the best of the best coming in the door when they were opting in, and that's why you had settlement rates of 75%. Turns out anybody who comes in the door is about the same grade of homeowner, and when you ramp up participation, so the numbers of people coming through the door are much greater, you still get a settlement rate of about 75%. <clears throat> Excuse me. And our, um, our goal now is to educate states to say, like Connecticut, like Philadelphia, like uh, New York, if you started an opt-in program and you're floundering, I'm talking to you, Maryland, become an automatic program, become an opt-out program, and you will suddenly see uh, participation rise considerably. The funny thing is, even these opt-in programs are seeing returns that, uh, that certainly justify their existence. And I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek simply because of the amounts of money involved. I think you, you described valuation as a guess based on a guess. Was that compounded right? It's, a, a excuse me, a guess compounded by a guess. Um, that's exactly what we had to engage in as, as we tried to calculate what the value of, uh, of foreclosure mediation is. I went back to 2002 prior to the housing crisis and saw you know, median housing price of about $150,000. What do you lose on a foreclosure? About $58,000 on a foreclosure because of all the carrying costs and so on. Uh, Center for Responsible Lending recently came out with numbers that say on a prime loan, you're going to lose 75, and on a subprime loan, you're going to lose 125, so significantly more. If we reduced payments for a homeowner by about 20%, and statistically, that's about the sweet spot. That's where uh, people tend, where the redefault rates get nice and low. Um, that costs us about $22,000, $23,000 on a loan, so you're saving $35,000 worth of loss. In, just to give you a sense, Connecticut spent $2 million on its program last year in 57 properties, and they did many, many more than that. They did over well over 1,000 uh, modifications in that state. At 57 properties, that's your $2 million right there. Uh, Congress has, you know, unlikely to pass, but has proposed competitive grant programs to states to start this up, and we've supported that. And more recently, we have turned to Fannie and Freddie and said, you do hundreds of thousands of these modifications. Shouldn't you be considering foreclosure mediation? And in fact, they'd beat us to the punch. They have a pre-suit mediation program in Florida that they operate. It's been very successful. They're looking to roll it out. I think our next suggestions would be go to other states that have basically no programs in place right now, places like uh, California that have had high foreclosure rates and do this there. And I think that there's an appetite, but again, rollout is taking some time for them, but they are seeing great success. Uh, I think finally, the, um, the mediation program is, the mediation system is one that should at least be in part of the discussion in the attorney general settlement that is now in the news. The state attorneys general have included within their uh, programs a third party review Different versions of the of the proposals include independent third party review. I, I would caution first of all if you if you have the person who is foreclosing paying the fee for the person who is you know working for them and overseeing this process that's a concern. But secondly, it's also duplicative of many of the mediation programs that exist in now almost half the states. If you have half your states who have a program that will give the homeowner a let's call it a bite at the apple of mediation of sitting down to settle, then that third party review is. You do your review, then you have a third party review, then you have a review and mediation. Why not leverage that existing process? The structure is in place, the people are trained. Uh, there's more than one person who's reviewing. Your third party is doing a lot of these. When you have a homeowner, a housing counselor, the, uh, the party themselves, and a professional in the room talking it out, the chances of finding an idea that might actually work are a lot higher. I think with that, I'm just going to hand it off. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you. So at the end of the last panel, uh, Will White said, you know, we should have taken that money and bought the mortgages ourselves and modified them. And I think he's right, and I, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, there, I'm with the National Housing Institute, and back in 2007, we were part of a working group that formed the Community Asset Preservation Corporation in New Jersey. We were looking at ways to try to get to scale to address this foreclosure crisis that was clearly coming. And CAPSI's uh, proof of concept project involved buying a pool of 47 notes and then resolving them. Um, and that was a really successful project, but we wanted to look into how to take it to scale. You know, as we all know, though, you've heard many, um, I won't repeat the statistics on the, the size of the crisis. So we began a series of meetings with capital markets players, uh, bringing people in uh, hedge funds, private equity funds together with people in the community development world 
to talk about uh, what we could do to attack this in a larger way. And I think I'm just going to lay out for you first what the folks, the capital markets folks told us, because I think it's very important when we're talking about how do we get these things modified. These loans that are in distress are being sold. Um, they're being sold in huge pools, billions of dollars all the time right now. 25% uh, of the mortgages out there are still in whole loan portfolios. We talk about securities all the time. It's a huge problem. We need to get to it. But there's $2 trillion worth of mortgages in whole loans, and the defaulted portion of that is for sale. Um, and they're private equity funds who are buying them. Now, what happens when they buy them? They take some smallish percentage of them. It varies by the pool, but some people have said around 30%, and they modify them. They knock down the principal. They refinance them into an FHA loan. What do they do with the rest of them? They foreclose, or they walk away, depending on how ethical they are. Uh, and so the problem with the fact that they need to return money to their investors. It's a private company. They're trying. Their investors are expecting 15% returns in 18 months. So there's a large portion of these properties that they buy that could qualify, they could, mod could be modified. The homeowners could afford a mortgage on the current value of their home, but it won't happen in the time that these private companies have. Um, they, need, you know, they need to figure out their credit, they need to deal with their, back, their other debt, non-mortgage debt, whatever it is. Also, these companies will not go into judicial foreclosure states because they have to foreclose on a large number of their properties. They don't want to deal with New Jersey's, what, 800 and plus days to foreclose. Uh, they don't want to go into certain neighborhoods where they don't know what the value is if they have to sell. They write off entire zip codes as having zero value. But, so here's an opportunity, basically, was what came out of these meetings that we held. We saw there was an opportunity for uh, us to bring in anybody, in the whether it's nonprofit, government, mission-related, for-profits, who have access to patient below-market capital and knowledge of these neighborhoods and these counseling networks that many of you work with, we could do this ourselves. Um, and there are three, at the moment, programs out there that are in the process of figuring out ways to do this on, on a reasonably large scale. At the moment, all of them are using or hoping to use, depending on the you know, state of approval, it's still in process, um, hardest hit funds, so return to TARP money that was given out to the 19 hardest hit states, as the patient capital. So I'm going to talk, I'll give you just the one example, the one I'm most familiar with, which is being started by Mercy Housing. They're headquartered in Chicago, big national nonprofit housing group. They have headquarters in several states. And they're forming what they're calling a mortgage resolution fund. They are applying to Treasury. It is not approved yet, um, but they're applying. They're working with the um, Illinois Housing Development Agency, who's been very supportive in helping them write their proposal for hardest hit funds that would come in as patient capital. And they're going to leverage that one-to-one -one with private debt from the big banks, from mission-related investors. And they have interest. And this is, uh, this is looking pretty solid. And so they're going to get make this fund. They're going to go to these banks, the lenders, and say, you know, you're selling these, these pools of loans. They're going to buy them at competitive prices because these loans, the ones that they're particularly interested in the most in the hardest hit neighborhoods, are ones that the private sellers don't want. They're being stuck into other sales so that the banks can get rid of them and lowering the prices of those pools. So if they can sell them to somebody who wants them at a competitive price, that's you know, they are actually willing to sell in most cases, or in many cases. That'll be the you know that'll be negotiated on a case by case basis. But one of the things that Mercy is doing is partnering with American Mortgage Capital Group, which is one of these private equity firms on a fee for service basis, to have them do the valuation, the special servicing, the the pricing, all that stuff that they're really good at. It's what they do, but they're doing it for Mercy, and Mercy will run you know Mercy's investment committee will make the decision about which pools to purchase. Uh, looking, they're looking at their numbers based on their criteria. They expect to be able to modify about 60% of the pools that they buy. They'll be working with housing counselors, working on the back end debt, et cetera. This is a principal modification down, at least down to the current market value of the house so that the homeowners will not be underwater 
anymore. And there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> turn that off. Um, <clears throat> right. So and. You know, the other difference between this model and the private model is for the ones where it's not modifiable, they're going to do things like you've heard about with short sales or cash for keys, some kind of digni dignified transition for the homeowner that is also supportive of the neighborhood. <coughs> so when we're talking about, and, and there are versions of this, I should say, um, further development in Oregon, who's been working with Senator Merkley and his staff, um, they have a, a version of this where the state of Oregon is actually going to own the loans, and they're about to do their first deal. They have treasury approval. Uh, it works slightly differently than Mercy's, but the underlying idea is still the same. So we're talking about policy. If we want to support models like this, I should talk about the size. There's a partnership in New Jersey that's uh, looking to do the same thing. They're looking at 6,000 mortgages. Uh, Illinois is looking at tens of thousands, so this is this is not small potatoes. Um, when and it returns, this is the key for we've been talking about the partisan atmosphere. It returns the money to Treasury. This is not a subsidy program. This is a patient capital. The taxpayers are catalyzing something. The money comes back under the Mercy model. It comes back with interest. Um, so. When we're talking about politics, this is something that could have an appeal even in the current atmosphere, I would hope. So uh, federal support, it's great that, um, that the states, that many states are getting enga engaged and being willing to support versions of this. Obviously, if we could uh, direct money directly from Treasury, redirected HAMP funds, et cetera, that would move it forward much faster. It would also help if we could extend the 2017 call date for the hardest hit funds. Just let these funds rotate because they're going to rotate, uh, let them rotate it several more times before they come back. And then much talk has been um, raised here about Fannie and Freddie. We need to figure out a way for Fannie and Freddie to be able to sell their loans before they get to REO. It will save the taxpayers money. If you have a $195,000 mortgage, and the home is worth 150,000 and it goes to REO it's it's going to be worth hardly anything you just heard you know you lose 58,000 or more if you can sell that in a pool for less than 150,000 but more than you would get if it went to REO you'll be saving the taxpayers money you'll keep a family in their home you stabilize a neighborhood so we need to figure out how to get Fannie and Freddie on board uh, to expand programs like this Okay. So, uh, on behalf of the uh, National Community Reinvestment Coalition, I'm honored to join you today. Um, I have a slide that's blank. Not sure what that is. Hmm. So the slide is blank after <laughs> it wants to say who I am, but it doesn't want to share information. So maybe while I say a few words of introduction, um, the folks in the back room can figure out what's going on. So um, I really quickly, <clears throat> first of all, I thought having a PowerPoint might be uh, much more powerful for two reasons. Um, obviously, my thinking didn't go through technology. Uh, two reasons. One is that I've never been able to give comments in less than 10 minutes. So if I had five slides, I could stick to two minutes apiece. Uh, but now my cue is not working. The second thing is I think that uh, playing uh, sort of the cleanup batter today, there have been so many uh, approaches and proposals put forward. What I did, uh, you know, actually before even hearing all the presentations, was just sort of outline uh, my own set of strategies. I would uh, outline five things that I thought would need to be done in a comprehensive approach to dealing with the foreclosure crisis. And then as I went through, I would highlight some of these issues that have already been raised by other speakers. 
And uh, because interestingly enough, the speakers have sort of talked about most of the strategies, albeit not all of the strategies. So I hope this might be a helpful way of helping you see and understand uh, the proposals that have been put forward. So I'll just keep talking until and unless the slide comes up. Um, so there are five strategies that I would put forward, and we've heard parts of all of them. First is we need to stem the foreclosures directly. The second is we need to sustain home ownership uh, post foreclosure, and I'll talk about that a little bit. The third is minimize the damage from vacant and abandoned uh, properties. That's one piece of the puzzle that hasn't been talked about a lot today, but really does have a profound impact on future foreclosures and on rebuilding. The third is to rebuild the home ownership market, which is what I was going to spend maybe two or three minutes on. And then finally, a piece that was mentioned only tangentially, which is employment, but specifically looking at explore local employment strategies, and that's, that piece of it hasn't been addressed at all. So I'll spend a little bit of time on those two. So first is to stem the foreclosures. And in terms of stemming, stemming the foreclosures, at <clears throat> there are several things that I think need to be done. Uh, Senator Merkley started off this morning uh, and several others with the address the problems with HAMP. Um, our panel addressed with Adam bankruptcy code. But the third is um, comprehensive initiatives at a community level. And the one I'll just highlight for you really quickly is the Chicago Homeowner Preservation Initiative that provides a full range of services, everything from pre and post uh, counseling, uh, direct foreclosure mitigation intervention. It also provides uh, assistance in uh, securing, acquiring, rehabbing properties and disposing of them. And finally, sharing of best practices across the city of Chicago. That program was, uh, was extremely uh, successful and has been expanded now. It's called Hopi now. There's a regional component called Ropi. There's also the pursuit of, lo of local jurisdictional and legislative action, and Alon talked about several of those, and then assisting unemployed and underwater home borrowers. And the Pennsylvania, uh, state of Pennsylvania has a program that's been in existence since the 1980s. It's a very effective program, and I would recommend uh, that you uh, take a look at that if um, unemployment is an issue in the areas in which you are focused on foreclosure mitigation. Again, I, I hadn't planned to talk about all the slides. I, you could get a sense of what the slides were. I was just going to touch on one or two of the bullets on each slide. Uh, the next one is sustained home ownership uh, post foreclosure. I think this is really important. Uh, Miriam talked about one uh, set of initiatives. Uh, since this crisis began, one of the things that gives real anxiety to community organizers and people who are in the field working on behalf of community is that we are now seeing investors um, parachuting into neighborhoods across the country uh, and purchasing properties, yet the nonprofits that are actually working there don't really have immediate access to those properties to uh, return them to home ownership for uh, local residents. One of the programs that I think is most powerful, it hasn't been mentioned today, is the Boston Community Capital Program called Stabilize Urban Neighborhoods, or the SUN program. It's a fabulous program, and I recommend uh, that people take a look at it. Um, now I don't have the pointer. <laughs> that, people, that, that people take a look at that program that people take a look at that program if you're interested. The way it works, just really quickly, is that um, they actually, the Boston Community Capital Fund actually secures the property on the day of foreclosure, at which point the price is actually adjusted to its real value, which they find to be, they've been able to purchase properties at between 70% and 35 to as low as 35% of their original value. And they turn around and resell that property right to the, uh, to the homeowner that actually lost the home. I think this is a fabulous program because we all know that in so many cases, uh, a, a reasonable modification could keep a consumer in the home and yet they're forced into foreclosure. And this program basically says, look, if, if you could have uh, afforded a reasonable modification, uh, they're not going to just let it go to foreclosure and be bought by an investor. They're going to step in on behalf of the homeowner and sell it back to them. There's some bells and whistles around the program that I can go into if you're interested in Q&A. But again, I just wanted to put the program on your screen. As I said, one of the things we haven't talked about today is the issue of um, stabilizing communities in the context of uh, enforcing codes. There are a number of initiatives that have happened uh, around the country. 
uh, that have been in play for years and some are new, uh, starting with uh, very effective property registries that allow for greater code enforcement and lots of penalties. I think the stiffest uh, city uh, penalties that I've heard of are uh, in LA, in which they have the authority to charge uh, uh, up to $1,000 a day for code violations, up to $100,000. Uh, that certainly will get people's attention really quickly. The next is promote home ownership, and I want to talk about this a little bit because the reality of this whole foreclosure crisis, as we all know, it's sort of there, there are two sides of the puzzle, right? The one side is help people maintain and sustain home ownership on the one hand. The other hand is make sure there's a rich and vibrant home ownership market on the other. And one of the things we're focused on, and Senator Merkley again uh, really drove this home in his conversations around the future of home ownership and the rules around QRMs and others, is that we are literally watching the doors being slammed on the potential for home ownership, particularly for communities of color, uh, low and moderate income households across America, and that will not bode well for those communities in any respect. Um, so one of the things we have to do is make sure at a national level the national rules make sense. But also at a local level, there are, there, we need some new models of home ownership. And one of the new models uh, is lease purchase. I think the, the oldest and largest lease purchase program in the country is Cleveland Housing Network's program, which has been in place for over two decades. Um, they uh, have a program for very low-income households that's funded with the low-income housing tax credit. The holding period for the leases is very long, driven by the uh, financing mechanism. It's 15 years, but uh, the consumers are actually able to buy those homes at roughly a third of the market value at the end of the 15-year period, and they estimate roughly 90% of the participants in the program actually have become homeowners as a result of it. There's another program that I think is fascinating. Uh, I've been trying to get some more recent data on it. I refer you to it. It's Self-Helps Housing Services Program, working with Fannie Mae. What's really powerful about this is that Self-Help is working with Fannie Mae not only to perfect a national uh, lease purchase program, but also create a secondary market for it. And generally, the way it works is that local nonprofits would pay off acquisition and rehab costs through a uh, lease purchase mortgage that would be developed by Fannie Mae and that would be originated by a lender that's working uh, with self-help. Self-help would actually purchase the loan, and as that loan is converted to a mortgage, it would be sold to Fannie Mae. And my understanding is Fannie Mae has given authority for up to $200 million worth of purchases of those loans. Uh, the pilot has begun in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is being expanded to Atlanta and Chicago. And NeighborWorks has uh, also recently launched a, uh, a, a a pilot program that they call Pearls uh, in Waco, Texas. Again, I don't have time to go into the details, but I think really getting into the lease purchase market is really important because of, if no other reason, the, the very last bullet on that screen, which is the issue of credit scores. Credit scores are just, uh, you know, the communities of color, low and moderate income communities are really taking a beating from this whole uh, economic downturn and credit scores are a major issue. When you combine those with a lack of down payment, you really understand if you're going to jumpstart the market for home ownership in uh, distressed communities, um, both urban and rural, you really need some new models. Oops. And the last piece is on initiate local strategies for employment and entrepreneurship. One of the interesting things about um, this whole foreclosure crisis is we've known that employment is really now the driver of uh, foreclosures. It has been now for several years, probably the last three. And, um, and when we're looking at sort of employment strategies, we're often looking at national employment strategies, not really looking at what can be done at a local level. And the reason I put this uh, slide up is that there are things like community benefit agreement, best value contracting, and other agreements that are now really being pushed in terms of the envelope being pushed by local governments to figure out ways in which, particularly through local government procurement and contracting um, activities, they can actually require through the bidding process, or not require, but encourage through the bidding process, that in fact uh, that uh, 
contractors who come to the table with opportunities for community, whether it's paying living wages as opposed to minimum wages, whether it's hiring from particular neighborhoods or uh, particular uh, communities based on certain types of attributes, whether it's including as part of their contracting the um, positioning of community services, paying for activities that might offer training activities for local residents. There are a lot of these um, what I call best value contracting agreements that are being put together. And um, all of these things have been captured in a paper that uh, I think Reed mentioned when he uh, uh, introduced me earlier on called Rebuilding uh, Distressed Communities. You can find it at NCRSC's website. It is very, very lengthy, and it goes into all of these strategies in uh, great detail. And with that, I think I'll just okay. call it a wrap. Thank you. Okay. screen here and we'll have a, an extended um, conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Jim, I'm, I am glad you mentioned the, the self-help lease purchase uh, work. We were actually, um, Catherine Godshock, who works there, was um, going to join us today and, and, and couldn't, but it is an idea that I, I do think uh, deserves some greater uh, attention and is quite promising. Definitely want to invite you, if you have some uh, questions for each other, to um, to think of those now. But, but I, I want to start us off by um, uh, asking a, a little bit about uh, the, the potential of increasing the um, capacity of some third-party actors. I mean, a lot of the, the solutions, the interventions, really re require other entities to kind of come to the table and, and participate in the process, whether it's um, in, in the bankruptcy uh, process or in, in the mediation and some of these, these other uh, um, um, uh, policy proposals. Uh, you know, w w are there some ideas out there about how or what are the challenges that you might identify about um, engaging some of these other, other third party uh, actors to, um, to participate in the different spheres? I can give you a couple. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about taking nonprofit housing folks and uh, capital markets players, uh, there's a huge prejudice against nonprofits. In, and not in that even if you put forth a, uh, some, a project that pencils out, the immediate reaction is, no, nope, that's going to take forever. It's going to be full of red tape. It's going to be full of, I don't want to touch it. Uh, so that's one, that's one reason why the programs that I mentioned are actually starting their own funds and doing their own purchases instead of what we had originally thought of, which was that nonprofits could step in and partner with these purchasers to take the portions of their pools that they didn't want. <coughs> but in order to, in order to be able to play in this space, uh, the we need to start thinking about the financial capacity of of the nonprofit. It doesn't have to be nonprofit. Again, the further development model that's working in Oregon and then in Arizona that is a mission driven for profit. We have to be willing to work, uh, you know, outside of our nonprofit sphere and work with our funders and our investors and think differently about how the funding comes so that you have it up front and you're not waiting for nine months to negotiate a grant or a PRI before you can come in and, and purchase a pool of loans or a mortgage or something. So in terms of creating partnerships in the for-profit world, that's, that's a huge step that we have to address. So all I was going to say was the reason that I wanted to show the slides about comprehensiveness, Re, your question is really, really challenging, and I don't think there's any magic solution. But I think for me, the more uh, bells and whistles that local governments working directly with nonprofits can tie together in terms of getting resources focused in a way in which other parties who have been sitting historically on the sideline can see real potential to impact. So I'll go back to the things about hiring, for example. If, in fact, you know that you're going to be requiring from uh, city contractors and vendors and others certain kinds of community um, uh, results, that then helps, I think, you leverage going to foundations and going to banks and going to others to bring them to the table. And I think the more that you're able to build sort of a loud noise around a real potential impact that will result in a positive outcome, I think that that is, to me, that's the best way to bring third parties to the table who are not participating now. Short of that, I think it's going to be very, very challenging. I think really being able to show an impact, and then also uh, bells and whistles again. Things like actually enforcing codes. So for example, there are lots of, uh, of really innovative strategies whereby vac vacant and abandoned properties can be taken into receivership 
and rehab before the title is even transferred, or alternatively, are rehabbed after title is transferred. Depending on the, the local market conditions you have, it would be useful to put into a place a very aggressive program to take into ownership vacant and abandoned properties. And once, the, uh, once folks know that you can actually secure those properties and you're going to rehab them before title changes, again, I think it helps to build a, a loud noise around there's real impact, potential impact for change here. But I think you have to really be looking comprehensively in this environment of very, very scarce sources and so much distress. I, I think what James is saying is, is, is very important just in terms of frame, how we how we think framing the issue here. Um, we can see this as sort of a narrow issue simply of foreclosures and trying to prevent them. And that's really a finance issue. Can you restructure the mortgage such that it works with the finances of the of the homeowner? But then there's the, lar the larger question, of, and, we, and we need to recognize that not all foreclosures are going to be preventable. And how do we minimize the impacts on communities? And, and that's kind of sort of the back end part of it. And also on the front end, how do we try and revitalize communities more generally so that there aren't the economic problems that lead to foreclosures? Um, I, you know, I my th the work I do focuses very on really on the narrow question, not the broader question. But I, I think the broader point is is very important. And on the narrow question, we really have kind of two two problems. We have a capacity problem dealing with just num uh, limited number of personnel who have the skill set for uh, for dealing with uh, with mortgage restructuring, and some of that you know there's uh, what we've heard is that we can sort of leverage up on related skill sets. So commercial real estate attorneys have a lot of the skills needed to do residential uh, foreclosure, uh, residential mortgage restructurings, uh, bankruptcy courts. Are not, you know, that we don't have that many federal bankruptcy judges, but one thing that's often misunderstood about uh, proposals to restructure mortgages in bankruptcies is it's not the judges doing the, the restructuring. The bankruptcy judges just sign off on the proposal if it complies with the law. That the work is being done by the homeowner or really the homeowner's attorney. So that's a way of leveraging an attorney, a, a set of attorneys who have, you know, number one, an incentive to try and recruit, recruit clients, and number two, have skill in restructuring debts. Uh, we also have way, you know, ways of doing this through, uh, through third party, through third party nonprofits, and what we've heard is that, you know, there's a, there's a, a funding challenge, and that it's really, can we find sources of, it, it, you really can need to think of this maybe as some kind of a bridge capital, that, uh, that is something, uh, someone who can hold, that, hold the mortgage for a while, while it gets restructured, but is not ultimately looking at being a long-term, you know, permanent mortgage lender. These are the, they're not easy answers to the to these problems, but these are kind of the two capacity issues that we have: a uh, skill set issue and a, and a funding issue. And some of them we can do. Uh, what a bankruptcy gets rid at least deals with the funding issue. Um, I'm sorry, it actually deals with both. It gives you some of the skill set and gives you some of the funding, but you need more than that. In the mediation space, um, you said third parties, and I was racking my brain to figure out who's a third party. And obviously, everybody. Huh? <laughs> everybody. You mean? It, uh, yeah, I mean right. every yeah. other than the homeowner and the lender servicer. Everybody's a third party, and yet nobody's a third party. Mm -hmm. And that's that's uh, the most successful foreclosure mediation programs. And I'm I'm just gonna latch my wagon to Philadelphia and say, just go there and see how they mm -hmm. do this. Um, they have discovered, first of all, on the front end, that you get your stakeholders in the room. Your community organizations are going to help you with outreach. You've got to get the executive involved because you're going to want advertising and speeches. You're going to need the legislature involved. You're going to need money. You're going to need you know, law enforcement. You're going to need all these other things. And everybody needs to sit around the table at the beginning. And when you get them on board, no matter how far away they are, so long as they're willing to come to the meeting, they're also willing to be part of the process. And once they're invested, they want to see it succeed. So that's, that's the success model in mediation, and therefore there is no third party, the, the back end of that is, you're right, the Philadelphia courthouse said, man, every, you know, not everybody who comes in here gets a modification, but they need social services, they need WIC, they need this, they need that, and so they just, they meet on Thursdays and they called everybody up who does that stuff and they said, can you send a representative down here and a whole bunch of paperwork, and that's what they do, and instead of doing, you know, they have these foreclosure, um, excuse me, mortgage modification events by like Wells Fargo, Imagine that, except it's every social service that a homeowner who is in distress might need, and they put that together in one place, um, in a place like Philadelphia. So it works on both sides. 
So, um, all right, let's um, take some questions from uh, the audience here. We'll start in the back. Um, and raise your hand. Let me know if you have one. We might stack up a few here at the end so we can get as many um, people to participate as possible. But yes. Um, can you hear me? Mm hmm. Okay. I'm Ruth Sussman with Consumer Action. I'm interested, um, first of all, this whole panel has been excellent, so thank you. Um, I would like to um, hear a little bit more about the settlement rates on these mediation programs. I'm interested, it sounded as if you were including short sales in the settlement rate figures, and if so, I'm interested, are you seeing um, real principal reductions, and what percentage of the settlements are principal reductions versus um, short sales, and um, in general, if consumers were looking to um, find out about the mediation programs available to them in their state, what's the best place to direct them to? The, the settlement rates that I quoted you at 75% do indeed include deeds in lieu of foreclosure and uh, short sales. The actual se underlying settlement rate, and I'll, I'll give you Connecticut as a, as a baseline, they are seeing, and they report their numbers in detail, so it's, it's really nice. They are seeing a, a settlement rate um, where you're modifying the, more, the loan at about, I think they used to see 62, and now they're at 64%. So that means 64% of people will walk in the door, walk out with a loan mod in their home. The principal modification rates have been low, and they've been creeping up, but they are low. I would say that I'm, these are anecdotal. They're not included in the numbers. I believe that they are somewhere in the 10% range. The other place I would look, incidentally, because there's a good dovetailing between the two data sets, is Fannie and Freddie in their 10Qs and 10Ks report what their modification rates have been like and the kind of modifications they do. They do tend to dovetail nicely with the kind of modifications that you're seeing out of these programs. If you want all the detail, like everything I know has been dumped on a piece of paper and put on the internet, uh, that's uh, now we're talking is the update I did uh, at the end of last year and is available on the American Progress uh, website. Uh, I believe I got everything. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. No, I can't remember the end of your question, but I think I, I covered it there. Oh, wherever they would learn uh, about these programs, correct. The um, Mediate.com is OK, and uh, the folks at the National Consumer Law Center have put up uh, websites. But if you live in a state and you Google your state name and foreclosure mediation, if there is a foreclosure mediation program, it'll pop up as the first search term in Google. So I'm, hmm. I'm going to go with Google on that one. <laughs> go, <laughs> go with the Google. All right, let's see. Uh, right here, these two. Uh, my name is Alejandro Becerra. I'm with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, this question is primarily for Mr. Carr. Uh, you mentioned two successful programs, one in Chicago, one in Boston. Uh, what role does the National Civilization Trust have in, 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 those in those programs, and what role is it having nationally in rebuilding distressed communities? Uh, so I can't tell you the specific role of National uh, Community Stabilization Trust in those specific programs. I, I just don't follow it that closely. I know that the Stabilization Trust had sort of a, a difficult start, and it, it's not surprising so many issues that they're dealing with, the first uh, look programs, et cetera, et cetera. But my understanding is that the program is now gaining uh, its legs, gaining some traction, and doing better. But I just I haven't really studied the details of, of their uh, the metrics on their performance yet, where they're having real success or not. Sorry, Just Andrew? Even for a minute, the, yeah. the trust is working with um, the programs that I was speaking about in terms of helping those uh, programs source pools of loans. And in Oregon, they're working with their reverse look program to help people who the counselors have a loan that they want to buy through this program, and the trust is helping get to the lenders, and they'll be working with Mercy's program as well. Andrew? Uh, this is a question, I guess, from Miriam and for Adam. Uh, if anybody else wants to weigh in on it, that'd be fine, too, to the extent you guys know the answer to this. Uh, to what extent are Who are you and where do you work right now? Uh, I am uh, Andrew Jakovics with the US Department of Housing okay. and Urban Development. Thank you. Um, but the question is your own. The question is mine. Yes, uh, I probably should get one of those Fed type <laughs> disclaimers. Okay. Um, but I guess the question is, to the extent that banks have expressed interest or are currently selling off uh, distressed notes, the, the NPLs, um, is there any sort of pushback in terms of not wanting to create special pools of deeply distressed loans in particular communities because of impacts on mark-to-market -market implications for capital adequacy? Whereas if they can kind of toss a couple of lousy loans that these uh, private equity folks would otherwise not want to modify or couldn't modify based on their, their cost of capital. Um, 
the you know it, it may bring down the total value of a pool by a couple of pennies, but if you have sort of these whole pools moving at severe distress, um, if there is in fact an a, a kind of a pushback effect onto the rest of the balance sheet that they may not be un not be willing to, to take on. So you guys know anything about the way those their approach to that, or whether that's been raised as, as a red flag? I don't know that directly. I know that um, the folks who are putting these funds together are talking with the sellers along the way, and they haven't encountered any any issue yet. Um, there are, I mean, there are all sorts of things that that they'll run into. There are some uh, some banks who may not want to sell um, because they know it's going to keep. They, they, they're concerned about moral hazard, even though once it's out of their hands, it's it's not an issue. But I haven't heard that raised. It's a it's definitely a very good question. I I don't know a specific answer to the question. What I can tell you, though, from the um, from the private equity funds I've spoken to, is that they're the one of the difficulties they have is is sort of their exit strategy. They're not looking to hold these loans for a long time. Basically, they want to buy them at a deep discount say buy them at 60 cents on the dollar and then have them refinanced into let's say FHA loans at you know what would basically be you know 80 cents on the dollar and the faster they can do it the better it is for them because they you know that return uh, is going to be the same return but over a shorter period of time so one of the I think the real thing we need to look for is whether you know how much they start using FHA short refi and is if there's any way for them to you know, if we can kind of crack, so uh, we heard that there's about $2 trillion of balance sheet loans, um, which I think probably are, um, tend to be performing a little bit better, I'm, I'm not sure, but tend to be performing better than the, than the securitized loans. If there's any way we can crack open those securitized trusts and pull the loans out, that would be kind of the ideal way to do this, but I, I'm not sure what the tool is for that. I think you're also hearing that what you're seeing from the equity funds is arbitrage, right? I want to come in at 60, get out at 80, and I think what we're hearing from folks like um, Miriam is let's get the folks who are going to hold this for a while in at 60 so they can see the upside as opposed to buying it from some from an arbitrageur at 80. Yes. And also, they may not be asking. You you implied that these the programs I was talking about would be asking for special pools of distressed loans to be put together. That may or may not be the case. Some of them are looking and asking for specific loans, and some of them are going in and and cherry picking. Not really any more than um, than the private funds.